When I was deeply focused on the project I was working on, my mobile phone rang at the most inopportune moment. Annoyed, I took it out of my pocket and saw an unfamiliar number on the screen. Expecting to see an annoying telemarketer, I reluctantly answered the call. To my horror, the call turned out to be even worse. The caller asked for Mark Mallon, to which I reluctantly confirmed my identity. The caller then asked me to wait for Miss Peterson, but instead of obeying, I quickly ended the conversation. A minute after my suspicion, another call rang. Mr. Mallon, I'm very sorry that we were disconnected. Please wait for Miss Peterson, said the voice on the other end. Without hesitation, I ended the conversation. The phone rang again, and I reluctantly answered. There was disappointment in the caller's voice as she tried to explain the situation to me. I interrupted her by saying, Please inform Miss Peterson that I am not interested in talking to her today or any other day. With that, I hung up the phone and tried to focus on my work. Five minutes later, the phone rang again. When I saw the number I knew from previous calls, I decided to ignore it and send it to voicemail. A notification appeared on the screen that I had received a message but I did not check it. My action plan had already been drawn up, so I focused on putting everything in order in front of me. The phone broke the piece again, forcing me to turn it off. I remembered one of the very first lessons on working with power tools. Always concentrate on completing the task at hand. This not only ensured safety, but also helped to pass the time. I concentrated on carefully placing the beams, pausing to inspect my work before lifting the frame vertically and leaning it against the wall of the unfinished basement. Leaning on the frame, I found one of the pre-drilled holes in the horizontal bottom board and took a second pneumatic hammer to hammer long concrete nails along the bottom. A quick check with the level confirmed that everything was level, and I returned to the first pneumatic hammer to secure the top. After making sure that the job was done perfectly, I stepped back to admire the finished result. Alone in a dim basement, my progress turned out to be insignificant, but I quickly assembled the frame and hung it in just 15 minutes. Counting on four frames per hour, I calculated that by the evening I would be able to finish finishing the entire room, which would bring me one step closer to completing the project. I felt relieved that the previous tasks of laying cable lines, electrical wiring and air ducts had passed without problems. Thank God. The plumbing was already in place, so I had nothing to worry about. Tonight, I'm focusing solely on completing the framing work. On Saturday I will install insulation and panels, and on Sunday I will lay parquet tiles. This progress will definitely bring me a reward for the weekend. Six packs of beer cooling in the refrigerator. It's amazing to think that in just a few weeks I will complete the entire basement construction project. It's also amazing to realize that now I'm limited to one pack of beer on the weekend. But not so long ago, I was drinking six packs as a warm-up before a heavy drink. Thank you to Miss Peterson for helping me make positive changes. Miss Denise Peterson, my ex-wife. Now I couldn't get rid of the feeling of bitterness towards her. How could the woman I once loved so much turn into such a vindictive person? I tried to push these thoughts away and focus on my work. The sooner I finish, the sooner I can relax, have a drink and hopefully avoid unpleasant dreams. That was my reality. I was just trying to get through every day without dwelling on the past. Find a way to occupy yourself so that the pain does not creep into the soul. It may not be an ideal way to live, but it's certainly better than feeling like you're dying every day, I mused. With these thoughts in mind, I began to prepare the boards for the next frames, one by one. After a long day at work, I went upstairs to have a drink and take a hot shower, and then went to bed. The next morning, I finally remembered to turn on my cell phone and found 20 missed calls and voice messages from the same number as the day before. I realized that my quiet weekend was about to be interrupted due to the need to work. Despite all my attempts to avoid it, I found myself knee-deep in email and business matters before the day even started. Sitting at the kitchen table and reluctantly eating cereal, I realized that the calm I had hoped for was quickly slipping away. It seemed that no matter how hard I tried to escape from the chaos of work, she always found me. 
so much for a quiet weekend. I went down to the basement, feeling a load of fatigue pile up as I get ready for the insulation installation job. Putting on the mask, I turned on the portable radio to drown out the noise of my own thoughts. The familiar melodies of classic rock became the soundtrack to my work, accompanied by the occasional expletive escaping from my lips. After several hours of work, I finally finished the installation and went upstairs for a well-deserved rest. While enjoying a turkey sandwich, I looked out at a dreary November day, the rain pattering on the window pane. Memories of the same rainy day last year came flooding back to me, adding a bittersweet tinge to the loneliness of the moment. I remembered arriving in Chicago on Thanksgiving morning and standing outside my relative's house, soaked from the rain. This impromptu visit was not planned because I did not receive an invitation from my wife, children, or mother-in-law. When the door opened, I was greeted by the surprised expression on my brother-in-law's face. Without waiting for an invitation, I confidently entered the noisy house. Silence reigned from my unexpected appearance in the cheerful atmosphere. My son Brian, who was 14 at the time, was standing on the doorstep. He was looking at the floor. Susan, my 17-year-old daughter, quickly left the room. Denise, my wife, freed herself from the arms of a strange man who held her so tightly. Despite her embarrassment, she tried to smooth over the awkwardness by introducing me to Paul Starling. The man stood up and held out his hand to shake mine, but I just stood and stared at him until he took his hand away. At that moment, my mother-in-law burst into the room, wanting to defuse a possible conflict. I was standing in the doorway, water dripping from my raincoat. Oh, is that you? We weren't expecting you. When did you arrive? I heard my mother-in-law's words but ignored them, focusing on trying to catch my wife's eye. She seemed more interested in something on her mother's wall and didn't turn to face me. Disappointed, I returned to the front door and went outside to call a taxi. The hope is that I will be able to catch a taxi before it leaves without me. No one bothered to leave the house and try to convince me to stay. With a heavy sigh, I stopped indulging in painful memories. Going down to the basement, I began to install bulky sheets. The work progressed quickly as I used nails for the panels and my trusty claw hammer to secure them to the racks. Fortunately, the panels with cutouts for electrical outlets and air vents fit perfectly. When everything was ready, I was finally able to use the heater without any problems. I found that I was sweating fast, so I didn't need any extra heat. I was glad that I had prepared so well, because I only had a few planks and a couple of spare sheeting sheets left. I took them to the garage and stored them until I could bring them to the workshop. I installed the electrical outlets and finished laying the wires for each of them. The use of standard color markings made it possible not to confuse the grounding wire with the hot wire. Finally. I connected the system to the circuit breaker in the junction box. After making sure that the power is supplied to each new outlet and that the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system has sufficient circulation, I started screwing on the outlet covers and air ducts. I vacuumed the floor thoroughly several times to prepare for applying the glue the next morning. Having completed all my business, I finally allowed myself to take a well-deserved shower. The hot water relaxed my aching muscles, and I sank into a steamy embrace. It was a stark contrast to the freezing cold I experienced on the way back to O'Hare Airport after Thanksgiving. I felt completely exhausted, both physically and emotionally, when I tried to buy a ticket home. I didn't care about the expenses anymore. My marriage was beyond repair, and I was just waiting for it to officially end. Exhausted, I went to bed hoping that there would be a better day ahead. I fell asleep almost instantly, but I only woke up to the roar of the storm that broke out on the street on Sunday morning. I dressed quickly and went downstairs hoping that there would be enough electricity for the whole day. I switched the radio to a sports station to listen to the game while I was applying glue to the basement floor. I tried to spread it evenly over the entire surface, Although I was thinking about making a custom oak parquet floor, in the end I decided that it would be too expensive. Instead, I bought boxes of finished parquet tiles that were already ready to be laid. 
After letting the glue harden for the recommended time, I started laying tiles. I went back upstairs and started mentally planning my next big project. I planned to repair the floors quickly by sanding, painting and varnishing them. To do this, I need to rent a sander and a floor buffer, as these are the most necessary tools for the job. My workshop already has small grinders, jackhammers, hammers, brushes and rollers. While working, I have to be careful not to damage the antique baseboards and moldings. In addition, I will carefully register each individual item to properly place them in their respective rooms. I made fresh coffee in the kitchen, which was recently renovated. Bright fluorescent lights illuminated the space, showing off cutting-edge household appliances that sparkled like new. As I sat in the breakfast nook next to the newly built kitchen island, the bright Mexican glazed tiles gave the room a colorful feel. I expanded the kitchen by demolishing the load-bearing wall, turning the small servant's dining room into a spacious and modern kitchen. By expanding the shelves and the pantry, I only reinforced the feeling that the room was even bigger than before. Deciding to add the perfect finishing touch to my kitchen, I decided to build a brick pizza oven. While I was working on this latest project, the memories of how I met Denise came flooding back to me, taking me on a journey into the past. It all started at a party for freshmen, which was held at a local pizzeria on the university grounds. Reluctantly taking part in the event at the insistence of my roommate, I found myself in the crowd with a drink in my hands. It was then that I noticed her, a tall, athletic brunette with long, muscular legs and a stunning figure. It was a moment that would change everything. She was molested by a drunk man. I couldn't make out what he was saying, but whatever it was, it led to a quick slap on his face. Without hesitation, I stepped between them to prevent further aggression towards her. Despite my efforts, he continued to try to get to her in a fit of rage. I stood my ground and he pushed and shoved me, trying to get to her. Eventually, bouncers appeared and escorted the man out of the hall. Turning around, I met the most beautiful green eyes I've ever seen. Denise introduced herself to me, and I introduced myself to her. We chatted for a while, after which she left, and I decided that I would not see her again. But a month later, while walking around the campus, I heard someone shout my name. To my surprise, it was the same girl, only dressed in a shabby outfit with Greek letters, running towards me. She asked if I had any contraceptives, explaining that she needed them to complete a task for newcomers to sorority. The shock on my face must have been obvious as she quickly clarified the situation. I could only nod and blush as I reached for my wallet and handed her what she asked for, which I had kept since ninth grade. She screamed with joy, snatched it out of my hands and hurried to her friend's house. I stood and watched her beautiful figure disappear from sight. A month later, when the campus was buzzing with excitement about the reunion, I was returning to my dorm when a familiar face appeared next to me. I squinted, trying to remember where I'd seen her before. Hi, are you ready to save me for the third time? She joked. I furrowed my brows in confusion. I'm sorry? She stopped abruptly, forcing me to do the same, and then repeated her question. Are you ready to save me for the third time? I helped her at the pizzeria and during her sorority recruitment, and now she needed me again. Confused, I asked how I could help her this time. She explained that she was supposed to go to a reunion with a guy from our fraternity, but he turned out to be a jerk. The only way to refuse to travel with him is to find another couple. I replied sarcastically, well, it really boosts my self-esteem. I couldn't refuse such a generous invitation. I don't think she realized I was joking. She told me about her sorority, where she lives, and the time of the meeting. When I left, I was puzzled by what had just happened. Back in my room, I told my neighbor about the strange encounter. He advised me to go on a date, noting that otherwise I would spend the evening as usual, studying on Saturday night. Rummaging in a drawer, he took out a contraceptive device and suggested that I had a chance at luck. But luck wasn't on my side that night. I spent the whole day getting to know Denise while we chatted and ignored the game of our football team. After leaving the stadium, 
we headed to a cozy coffee shop to continue the conversation. We were so engrossed in the conversation that we didn't notice how the cafe closed. Walking back to her house, I hesitated, not knowing whether to kiss her. But Denise made the decision for me, saying goodnight and leaving without a kiss. Returning to my room, I couldn't help feeling that I looked somehow wrong in her eyes. When I entered the room, my roommate was nowhere to be found. By Sunday evening I was used to his absence. I lay down on the bed and fell asleep, and thoughts of those mesmerizing green eyes danced in my head. Over the next month, I repeatedly tried to call Denise, but they replied that she was unavailable. I heard that she started dating someone else. It was painful for me to realize that I had missed my chance even before I entered the playing field. A sudden clap of thunder brought me out of my dreams of Denise, forcing me to return to the basement and continue laying tiles, focusing on the intricate tongue and groove on the sides of each piece. I was only half paying attention to the process when I decided to take a break and get a new box of tiles. When I reached the end of the floor, I stopped to admire how well the tiles complemented the paneling. Looking forward to the end of the project, I quickly nailed the baseboards and announced with a satisfied smile that everything was ready. All that remained was to install the fixtures and molding for the crown, but that could wait until another day. Today I will celebrate the completion of the basement renovation before the start of the work week. During these hours, my main focus was on making money. In the evenings, I solved small tasks around the house that did not require a whole day off. The cycle started on Friday, when I was busy at home again. That day, I went to the Home Depot, bought a rented floor sander and buffer, as well as coarse-grained, medium-grained and fine-grained sandpaper for both floors of the house and loaded it all into my work pickup truck. Over the past week, I have devoted my evenings to the delicate removal of moldings and baseboards from all rooms of the house. I have carefully documented every detail and have already sandpapered them. All that remained was to sand these places with a grinding machine. Fortunately, the baseboards and moldings will hide all the flaws located close to the walls, so I won't have to worry about having to grind right up to them. When the phone rang, I saw another call from Denise's office. Throughout the week, I received rare calls from her. In the end, I added the number to speed dial so that I could easily recognize it. This simple action brought back to mind a long-standing memory of the phone call I received on Friday. I was busy studying in my dorm room when the phone rang. Assuming it was my roommate who usually answers the phone, I answered, but found that he had already left. Confused, I was preparing to receive the message when suddenly a furious voice rang out on the other end, demanding to know where I was. Out of surprise, I asked who it was, to which the voice introduced itself as Dennis. Annoyed and annoyed, I replied that she had called me and not the other way around. Where do you think I am? Come here soon. I hesitated whether to go, but the temptation to see her was too strong, and I ended up at her sister's house. I announced my arrival and waited. Soon I noticed Denise in the hallway. It looked like she was having a heated argument with some guy. The conversation was tense. She gestured at me, which caused a contemptuous look from the guy. She rushed out into the street and exclaiming, We need to leave, began to lead me. After a while I stopped and asked, Could you explain what's going on here? She stared at me with disappointment in her eyes accusing me of being annoyed by that scoundrel from the Brotherhood again. What is my fault? I replied, confused by her anger. I needed help! She exclaimed in despair. Why didn't you call your boyfriend? I turned away, feeling overwhelmed by the situation. I went back to the cafe where we had a date at the prom. She followed me and sat down next to me, her tone softening as she began to speak. Gradually, my anger dissipated when she opened up to me. Then she hesitated before confessing her attraction to me. Listen, I like you, but I'm not ready to commit to one person, so I want to maintain a relaxed relationship and date other men. If our bond is strong enough, we'll both feel it. Can you stand it? She asked. I doubted that I could share her with others, but when she kissed me, 
I realized that I had already fallen in love. Some weekends I was lucky enough to spend time with her, but others I suffered in my room, imagining her with someone else. Four months later we finally made love in her car, and my feelings for her only intensified. No matter how hard I tried to convince her, she remained adamant and continued to date other men. This confusing cycle lasted for two long years until the unexpected news came. She became pregnant. Time seemed to stop when she informed me that the baby was mine, and my stomach hurt. I saw the expectation in her eyes, I knew what she wanted from me. Internally, I was in a panic. I have carefully planned my future, finish a bachelor's degree in business, get an MBA and eventually get a high-paying job before proposing to Denise. This was not part of the plan, everything was happening too fast, which disrupted my carefully planned schedule. Denise has always dreamed of getting a degree in history and then going to law school. She had three more years of study ahead of her, and it seemed that all her plans were set. But suddenly everything changed. After discussing the possible options, we decided to go the other way. We're going to have a little wedding, and I'm going to work to support her at law school. Once she finds a job, she will support me while I get my MBA degree. It seemed like the perfect plan for our happy future. But everything changed for the worse when I met Denise's mother, whom we jokingly called the Evil Witch of the North. From the very beginning, she screamed at me, accusing me of ruining her daughter's life. The constant swearing didn't stop. My grandmother, who raised me, also doubted marriage. She insisted on a prenuptial agreement to protect her house, which I would inherit one day. Dennis was furious, but Grandma stood her ground. In the end, Dennis reluctantly agreed to sign a prenuptial agreement. Despite the tension, we had a quiet wedding and started our life together. The previous school year was difficult as Dennis was pregnant and I worked part-time to feed us. From mowing lawns to minor home repairs and contracting, I did everything to make ends meet. Despite the difficulties, we both managed to graduate from university. Denise gave birth to our daughter, Susan, and was accepted into law school. Her mom proudly hung graduation and baby photos around the house, but I noticed that I wasn't in any of them. I was lucky enough to get an internship at a brokerage firm, where I took on all the less desirable tasks that brokers didn't want to do. Despite the difficulties, I persisted in making cold calls and running errands during lunch. This determination paid off when I got my broker's license and started trading stocks under the guidance of a senior broker. As my skills improved, so did my income. I soon realized that no matter how many promotions and promotions I received, my savings remained at the same level. It seemed like my wife, Denise, always found ways to spend every penny I earned. In her third year of law school, she surprised us by announcing her second pregnancy. Eight months later, our son Brian was born. Suddenly, I found myself juggling the responsibilities of caring for a newborn, a three-year-old child, and a wife who was completely immersed in preparing for law school exams and for the bar exam. Countless times I had to bite my tongue when Denise or her mother complained about something, but I understood how important it was for Denise to fulfill her dream. So, I braved myself and continued to be her mainstay supporting her when she devoted her time to studying with the group. Sometimes I joined the guys at the bar to blow off steam, but I always left early to take care of the kids and give Denise some time for herself. Some of my fellow students disapproved of my goals and mocked me in front of Denise. Despite the fact that I wanted to argue with them, I restrained myself so as not to create problems for Denise. I preferred to ignore their jokes and pretend not to hear them in order to keep the peace. Finally, the long-awaited day came when the exams ended, and Denise found out that she had taken third place in her group. When she confidently walked across the stage at the prom, I couldn't help but feel a surge of pride holding our children in my arms. She beamed with happiness as she introduced me to numerous fellow students before going to the ball. It was only at 10 in the morning that she returned home, admitting that she had stayed with a friend after drinking too much. I couldn't resist objecting that she should have called me and asked for a ride, 
which led to a heated argument that ended in tears from our children. I devoted the next few hours to reassuring our children after this incident. In the end, I decided to ignore this situation because the damage had already been done and I didn't want to upset the children anymore. If studying at the Faculty of Law required a lot of effort, then preparing for the bar exam was a real torture. Denise and her study group immersed themselves in the study of the law around the clock for four months, preparing for a three-day exam. All this time, I've been providing her with all kinds of support, from foot massages to escorting her on late-night ice cream hikes. Denise passed the bar exam perfectly, getting the highest score, and quickly got a high-paying corporate job in Dallas. After her success, we decided to move, and I planned to get a bachelor's degree. But Dennis convinced me to postpone my studies so that we could focus on building our savings while she worked on becoming a partner in her firm. She believed that a family with two incomes was necessary for our financial security, and promised to support me in obtaining an MBA degree as soon as she reached her goal. I trusted her opinion and agreed to wait, realizing that it was necessary to lay a solid foundation for our future. After learning about a brokerage firm in Dallas, I decided to start working there. It took me a while to realize that Denise had that mindset. What belonged to her was inviolable, and what belonged to me was negotiable. In the end, I ended up being the only one responsible for the rent, car payments, household expenses, student loans, and all the other financial obligations we had. On the other hand, Denise seemed to only care about herself. Every time I tried to discuss her salary or finances, she would burst into an angry tirade. To this day, I have no idea where her money goes. After 10 years in Dallas, Denise was transferred to Atlanta from the company's headquarters. I came up with the idea to renovate my grandmother's old house, which I inherited after her death. But Denise did not support this idea, calling the dilapidated house similar to the Adams family mansion. I assured her that the Victorian mansion could be easily renovated within her budget. I suspected that Denise's reluctance stemmed from the fact that she felt offended that my grandmother insisted on a prenuptial agreement. Denise found a house with a high price and a strict partnership of homeowners. Despite my requests to think, she was determined. Reluctantly, I signed papers for a house I didn't like, in an area I didn't like, and paid dues to a country club I wasn't interested in. I changed jobs at a brokerage firm again, finding myself at the bottom of the ladder. I was struggling to make ends meet, barely managing to cover our expenses every month. The tension between us was interfering with our marriage. She started belittling me in front of our children. The turning point came when our house started to fall apart, and the homeowners association demanded expensive repairs that I couldn't afford. I was afraid to meet Denise, feeling like I was on the verge of a breakdown. A recent review of my work confirmed that I had exhausted my earning potential, as a result of which I was stuck in a dead end with no chance of growth. Despite my doubts, I sat down with Denise again to discuss our difficult financial situation. I reluctantly showed her my review of the work, feeling awkward about its content. She looked down on me again, confirming that her mother's negative opinion of me had always been correct. I sat in a depressed state while she left the table. The next day, she offered me a solution. Her company needed someone to temporarily manage the Chicago office, and there were rumors that whoever took on the role would most likely become the next partner in the law firm. She suggested that she and the children stay with her mother, and I stayed to solve the problems that I had created. I knew that even with the advantage I could do something good. As much as I wanted to vent my emotions on her, I restrained myself. It saddened me that the children were not too upset about the separation from me. On the contrary, they were thrilled to be able to move to Chicago, where they would be pampered by their grandmother. Leaving for the airport was heartbreaking for me, but the children were looking forward to leaving. Returning home, I couldn't help but cry. The next day, I set up a meeting with the board of the Homeowners Association to discuss my plans to renovate the house according to their standards. They rejected my plan, 
and put forward a number of strict conditions that I had to fulfill. I'm going to have to make sacrifices to make it work. Despite the temporary respite after my family left, I was still struggling to stay afloat financially. I started with simpler tasks that do not require special knowledge and skills, and moved on to more complex ones. It seemed like there were two more jobs for every job I finished, and I began to resent the endless cycle of expenses I found myself in. It was difficult for me to reach my family on the phone, and when I managed to get through, they abruptly ended the conversation. Feeling isolated and disconnected from society, I became addicted to alcohol to cope with this problem. Even though it was frowned upon at my job, I didn't care about it anymore. As the months passed and the winter holidays approached, I contacted Denise, asking her to come home so we could be together as a family. She explained that her work schedule did not allow her to come. I offered to fly to her, but she reminded me that our first priority is to repair the house, not spend money on vacation. Denise hinted that her family would be out of town for Thanksgiving, so I have no reason to visit. She handed the phone to Susan, who said the family was planning to meet at her grandmother's and she couldn't wait to see her cousins. After that, Brian answered the phone and said that his uncle was inviting him to the Bears game at Soldier Field on Thanksgiving Day. It all looked a little suspicious, and eventually I got tired of this situation. When I decided to go to Chicago, I found that I had found answers to questions that I hadn't even thought about before such as how easily I could be replaced. The most disappointing response came when Susan turned 18. Despite my repeated attempts to contact her and Brian after the trip to Chicago, leaving numerous voicemails asking them to contact me, they never bothered to answer my calls. It was only two weeks after Susan's birthday that I received a large envelope in the mail from Manila. Inside, I found that Susan had filed an official application with Cook County, to change her name from Susan Malone to Susan Starling. She motivated her decision by the fact that she wants to take the surname of her biological father, Paul Starling. The documents were accompanied by written statements from Denise Mullen and Paul Starling, in which they claimed that they began an intimate relationship in college and continued it in law school, as a result of which they had a daughter. Notarized DNA analysis results from three reputable laboratories confirmed paternity. In addition, there was a stamped copy of the judge's decision to change the surname in the case. It became clear to me that a similar revelation awaits me when Brian turns 18. Shortly after that, Denise called and asked about the package she had sent me. I confirmed that I received it. She explained that the copy was meant for her mother, but because of a mistake by the secretary, it was sent to me. She assured me that the secretary was fired for this mistake. But she couldn't help but feel responsible for this mess. She made a mistake more than 20 years ago. After I hung up the phone, I was handed the divorce papers. Despite the higher salary, she didn't think I deserved a fair share of our property. She insisted on keeping what belonged to her and argued that what belonged to me should remain mine. Despite the fact that she had never made financial investments in real estate, she still expected to receive 50% of the value of the property when it was sold. In fact, I was losing $400,000. I couldn't help but wonder what her reaction was when she received the property settlement agreement with my signature without any objections. When I focused on the floors for a minute, I noticed that I had finished sanding and polishing them and now they were ready to be painted and varnished. Admiring the progress made, I felt a sense of satisfaction. Tomorrow I will finish working with the stain, and by the middle of the week, I plan to apply several layers of varnish for additional protection. The stain I have chosen will complement the pastel colors in which I have painted each room. After opening the first bottle of long-necked beer of the day, I walked through the rooms noticing several small details that still needed attention. Fortunately, these were simple fixes that could be easily fixed. I wanted to do another big project. Continuing to explore the options, I fixed my gaze on the balcony of the master bedroom, which overlooked the vast backyard. It was then that inspiration came to me. 
The idea of a large pool with a hot tub or even a house with a pool seemed to me the perfect addition. Excitement overwhelmed me when I thought about the research and permissions needed for such a project. I imagined spending the whole summer working on the backyard, imagining the different sizes and styles of pools, and estimating the possible costs. As I listened, I heard the sound of an engine running and dissatisfied voices. Unable to observe what was happening from my seat, I quickly headed for the bedroom that overlooked the street. Looking down, I saw a rented U-Haul truck with a trailer trying to drive into the driveway of a neighboring house. The driver seemed to be out of control, the trailer collapsed on the wet grass, and the wheels were spinning helplessly. Without hesitation, I rushed outside and knocked on the driver's window, which surprised him a lot. She turned to me in surprise. Despite the chaos in which she was trying to fix the car and cope with two screaming children in the back seat, she was stunningly beautiful. Tears streamed down her face when I offered to help her. She nodded gratefully and accepted my help. I handed her my umbrella and she quickly took the children to a safe place under the porch. I jumped into the driver's seat, adjusted the wheels, and put her in gear to help her get back on the road. I stepped on the gas pedal smoothly, trying to keep the rear wheels from turning, and slowly moved forward to get out of the rut. To achieve this, I had to drive through most of her yard, but at that moment it seemed the easiest solution. In the end, I managed to get the truck and trailer outside and get ready for another attempt. Driving a car with a trailer is a skill that many have never had to master. The main thing when reversing with a trailer is to turn in the opposite direction than when driving without a trailer. Carefully, I steered the trailer down the driveway until both the truck and trailer were parked and ready to unload. I turned off the car and hunched over, rushed into the rain until I reached the porch. The children were clapping and the blonde angel was beaming. At that moment, I realized that I prefer to smile rather than cry. Here are the keys, I said, putting them in her little hand. Thank you for helping us. I don't know what I would do without you. She had the most charming southern accent. I am always happy to help my neighbor. I'm Mark Malone. I assume you're our new neighbors? I added, feeling a pang of rudeness for not introducing myself earlier. My name is Jenny Harris, and these two troublemakers are Kane and Billy. The children immediately objected to this description and ran to their mother, seeking comfort. I laughed at their antics, glad that the tension had passed. I jokingly said that I hoped they would help her unload the car, as the truck and trailer seemed very heavy. Sadness flashed across her face as she replied, No, they helped me with the loading. Only the three of us will unload. But I appreciate the offer to help and if it's too difficult I can always call my friends for help. I received another sincere expression of gratitude from her, and she thanked me warmly. I offered to start unloading on my own, and then sort out the rest of the details. The three of them returned to the house. There were cries of disappointment from inside. Entering the darkened room, Jenny informed me that I needed to turn on the electricity. I calmed her down and went outside to contact a friend who worked for an energy company. After giving the address, he remembered that he had been instructed to install electricity here. Since no one was at home, he had to leave in accordance with the company's rules. He planned to return on Monday afternoon to make another attempt. Now that there are new residents in the house, he will definitely install a meter and turn on the light. He agreed to come. I ended the conversation and informed Jenny that the electricity would be on soon. She thanked me, and the children clapped again with delight. I unlocked the trailer and started carrying the boxes into the dimly lit front room on a rainy day. Jenny helped carry light boxes into the house, and the two children watched from the porch. They were playfully arguing over who would sleep in their room first, and their cuteness was undeniable. Jenny rewarded me with a grin when she noticed that I was watching the children. I insisted that she leave the heavy boxes to me, took the big one from her, and added it to the stack inside. When we finished unloading the trailer, my friend John arrived in his company truck. The lights came on in the house, which delighted the children, 
who immediately began to explore every room. John returned to his truck to pick up the papers for Jenny's signature, and then turned to me and asked, Mark, have you unloaded everything yet? I admitted that we were still working on the trailer and hadn't even touched the truck yet. Without saying a word, John walked over to the trailer, picked up the box, and began to carry it inside. Inspired by his actions, I decided to make some phone calls. I suggested that Jenny and John relax a bit. When we were all seated, Jenny mentioned that she was a teacher at an elementary school. I was curious about how she managed to purchase a house in the area, but before I could ask a question, new guests began to arrive. Friends with their spouses and children showed up with pizza, beer for adults, and soda for children. The most important thing is that they came with their help. Frenzied activity began. Everyone helped unload the truck. My friends and I were given a tour of the house while the children ran after each other and discussed design ideas. Boxes were unpacked, things were put into rooms, furniture was placed, sleeping sets were assembled. Finally, the living room was decorated, which marked the completion of unloading the truck. We relaxed and enjoyed each other's company, marveling at how easily Jenny organized a spontaneous meeting with people she had just met. As I noticed, her friendly demeanor easily made connections between women, which manifested itself in the exchange of phone numbers and plans for lunch meetings. John subtly pointed out to me that I seemed to be the link between all these ladies. I couldn't help but chuckle at the thought. I shared my pool concept with him, which sparked a lively discussion between us, and other guys joined in with their suggestions. It was a pleasant scene. I was chatting with the guys, and Jenny was chatting with the girls, creating a harmonious atmosphere. We exchanged a quick glance and smiled at each other as the party began to die down, and the guests left. Jenny kindly allowed me to carry the sleeping children to bed, where she tucked them in and kissed them goodnight. In silence, we went down the stairs and out onto the steps. I handed her the beer, but she shook her head. I opened my bottle and took a long sip, enjoying the cool liquid in my throat. We sat in comfortable silence, just enjoying each other's company. Mark, you're my hero, she finally spoke up. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Jenny, I'm just trying to be a good neighbor. You don't have to thank me, I said. She shook her head. Nonsense. If it wasn't for you, I'd still be stuck in the yard with a debt to you, mister. I giggled. Just wait until you get to know me better. I took another sip of my drink. So, what are you going to do with this truck? Jenny looked pained. She told how angry drivers honked at her when she had to stop to refuel. Breaks for food and toilet are the only times when it was convenient for her to stop at the wheel of a truck. Due to her lack of driving experience, she was repeatedly delayed at gas stations, fast food cafes, and hotels. She often faced insults and outbursts of anger from other drivers, until she managed to get out of the situation. And now she faced a difficult task, to return the truck across the country. Tears welled up in her eyes when she told how the U-Haul store demanded that she return the truck to their office. I put a reassuring hand on her shoulder, trying to calm her nerves. So I'll drive the truck, I said. Jenny looked at me in shock. I can't let you do this, she insisted. You can't expose your children to another trip like this, I said, reassuring her. I can take care of it. Don't worry about the truck. I'm not going to steal it, and you know where I live. We continued to argue for a couple more hours, until my logic finally won out and she reluctantly handed me all the documents for the lease. When she asked when I would start the trip, I replied, around 9 in the morning. Realizing that it was very early, she suggested, maybe then you should stay the night. I shook my head and refused. Standing up, she suddenly hugged me and kissed me on the cheek, after which she disappeared into the house. I was overcome by a warm feeling when I returned home. The next morning, I knocked on Jenny's door. When I opened it, I was greeted by two energetic children who hugged my legs and affectionately called me Mr. Mark. Laughing, I picked them up in my arms and carried them into the house. Jenny nervously handed me a bunch of keys and an envelope with $20 bills, 
explaining that it was for gas and a bus ticket to get home. She asked about my return while I started the car and steered the trailer into the driveway. When will you be back? What is it? She asked curiously. I smiled and replied, sooner than you think. When I got on the highway, I suddenly stopped at a local U-Haul store before reaching the interchange. Once inside, I noticed the store manager and greeted him in a friendly manner. Hi, Mark. What's new? He asked when we shook hands. Hi, Perry. I'm returning the truck for a friend, I explained, handing him the documents. Perry's expression changed as he studied the documents. This lease was supposed to be circular, he said. The truck and trailer were supposed to be returned, but there were some changes. Now they need to be rented one way, and I'm ready to pay any additional fee for changing the conditions, I said. I asked Perry to clarify this at the rental office, and while he was on the phone, I could see how he was getting more and more upset. In the end, he angrily agreed to accept the delivery of the trailer and truck, and hung up the phone. When he came up to me, he warned me not to say anything. I just smiled and handed him the keys while he inspected the truck. I used a credit card to pay for a round-trip rental replacement for a one-way rental. The employee handed me a receipt. I thanked him and went outside to call a taxi. Thirty minutes later, I arrived home and was greeted by Kay and Billy, who were playing outside. They excitedly exclaimed, Mr. Mark, as I got out of the taxi. Jenny appeared on the street, alarmed, and her eyes widened in surprise at the sight of me. What happened? Don't tell me you had an accident! she begged. I grinned and informed her that I had returned after delivering the truck and trailer to the nearest U-Haul store. She looked disappointed and reminded me that when she rented the truck, it was designed for a round trip and I had to return it. But I managed to sort it out by talking to the manager of the local U-Haul store and he convinced her to let him take the truck. It may have been a little white lie, but it solved the problem without harming anyone other than the original tenants of the truck. Anyway, Jenny smiled when I handed her the check, signaling that the deal was done. You seem to be having fun, I remarked, noticing that she was wearing dirty clothes. She admitted that she underestimated the difficulties faced by the house. I assured her that if the situation got too complicated, she could always come to me for help. After returning the envelope with the money she gave me in the morning, I went to my house. Although I lost half the morning, I quickly managed to finish painting the entire second floor and proceed to the first. The feeling of calm that I had gained while working on the project was suddenly interrupted by thoughts of an attractive blonde neighbor. While applying the stain, I noticed that I was humming, a rare phenomenon for me. A knock on the door interrupted my reverie, and I found Jenny standing on the threshold in upset feelings. She had an accident with plumbing, water leaked under the toilet, and she asked me for help. I quickly gathered up my tools and went to her aid. Kay and Billy eagerly greeted me at the door. They took me upstairs to the bedroom where I found Jenny frantically wiping the bathroom water with a towel and squeezing it out in the sink. I put down my tools, knelt down and quickly turned off the water supply valve. After I flushed the toilet to empty the tank and bowl, more water flowed out, causing another flood. After assuring Jenny that I would handle the situation, I got to work. She imperceptibly moved away, and without attracting my attention, tried to imperceptibly take off her bra and panties that were hanging on the shower rod. I pretended not to notice her when she followed me and stood in the doorway. With practical ease, I quickly disconnected the cistern from the plumbing and took it out of the bowl. As expected, the wax ring was out of order, so I removed the remnants of the old wax ring and replaced it with a spare one from my repair supplies collection. Throughout the process, I explained every step to Jenny. I carefully placed the bowl on the flange and pressed down to ensure a secure seal. Then I asked Jenny to sit on the toilet lid so that her weight would help secure the wax ring. While I was working on fixing the bolts to the flange screws, a mischievous thought occurred to me. Even though the seal was securely fastened, I continued to hold Jenny in place, finding myself in an awkward position to complete the task. In the end, 
I had to ask her to stand up so I could attach the tank. Having bolted it securely, I turned on the water again and checked the flush. This time there was no sudden rush of water, which made Jenny cry out in triumph. I applied another layer of sealant around the base of the bowl, and then washed my hands and cleaned myself up. Jenny tried to hug me, but I gestured at my soaked clothes. Let me wash it for you, she insisted. I jokingly reminded her that in this case I would run naked, making her blush. Then she offered to treat me to a meal. But without a car, she couldn't go grocery shopping, so she and the children depended on delivery services. Seeing this, I offered to take them with me to dinner after I took a shower at home. She hesitated, afraid of inconveniencing me. But I reassured her and promised to pick them up at 6 o'clock in the evening. True to my word, I drove up to their house at 6 o'clock in the evening, and they came out to meet me. Jenny was pleasantly surprised to see that I had bought booster chairs for Kay and Billy. Having arranged for the children, I invited them to a wonderful Italian restaurant. While we were enjoying the meal, I got to know my new neighbors better, and Kay and Billy shared stories with me. Jenny sat with a smile on her face, watching her children grow attached to me. From time to time the children revealed some personal details that made Jenny blush, and she quickly changed the subject. After dinner, we went to the ice cream parlor, where there is a play area for children. It was very nice to see them playing and interacting with other children. Looked at her children with adoration. It was a reflection of the love that artists have tried to perpetuate throughout the history of mankind. Noticing that I was watching her, she quickly turned her attention to me. So, you fell in love with me, Jenny Harris, I teased playfully. Her cheeks turned crimson, and she wished the earth would swallow her up because of Kay's joke. Then our conversation turned to other topics, and we found out why Jenny doesn't have her own car. She explained that the reason for her current situation was her brother, an engineer. After returning from service abroad, he will take her car to his place. In the meantime, they plan to rent a car starting tomorrow. Nonsense, I said. Just borrow mine. I rarely drive it anyway. I'm usually in my truck. We argued until I finally convinced her that borrowing my car was the cheapest and most expedient solution to her problem. When we returned home, the children quickly fell asleep, tired of the entertainment. As we drove, I slowly showed Jenny the various controls and functions of the car, and she silently absorbed it all. When we arrived at her house, I took Kay inside, and Jenny unlocked the door. After putting Kay on the bed, Jenny put her to bed, and I went to get Billy. Jenny was already waiting for me to put him to bed, and I couldn't help but feel nostalgic for the days when I was raising a family. Jenny must have noticed the sadness in my eyes because she gave me a worried look. I tried to assure her that I was fine, but deep down I knew that I missed these moments more than I could imagine. I think she sensed that something had changed. When I handed her the car keys, she gently ran her other hand over my cheek, and standing on tiptoe kissed me gently on the lips goodnight. All the way home, I felt like I was going with the flow. The following Monday, I returned to work, but my mind kept returning to thoughts of Jenny. Unable to concentrate, I turned off my computer and spent the day doing various chores around the house, including finally finishing painting the ground floor. It turned out to be a productive day, as the list of home projects continued to shrink. I was just finishing work when I heard footsteps on the porch. No sooner had they knocked on the door, than I heard voices. Smiling, I opened the door and saw that Jenny and the two children were inviting me to join them for their first home-cooked dinner. They insisted on inviting me to sit down and eat, but I asked them to take a quick shower first. Jenny agreed and said they would be waiting for me. When I returned, the dining table was decorated with fried chicken in a southern style. The aroma of freshly baked apple pie filled the room, heralding his arrival. While the children were arguing over who would sit next to me, Jenny invited me to take a seat at the head of the table to resolve the dispute. The children sat on either side of me, and Jenny sat across from me, and we all said a prayer together before we started eating. 
I couldn't resist eating my portion, letting out a satisfied groan when a generous piece of apple pie was placed in front of me. For some reason, everything tastes better in the family circle. After enjoying every bite of delicious food, I discovered that I had been invited to take part in a series of children's games for the rest of the evening. When nine o'clock came, the children reluctantly went to bed, and Jenny followed them. Halfway up the stairs, she stopped and invited me to come up with her. I followed her example and lay down to read Billy a bedtime story, while Jenny took care of Kay. When the children were fast asleep, we quietly went downstairs where Jenny made coffee. While the coffee was straining, we both began to put things in order after eating, and after a while everything was in its place. She filled a large ceramic mug for me and asked me what kind of coffee I preferred. I replied, black, which made her add cream to her cup with a slight grimace. Handing me a mug, we went outside to the porch swing. The November evening was unexpectedly pleasant, and we enjoyed hot coffee. Our conversation turned to Kay and Billy, and I ended up talking about Susan and Brian. As we continued to talk, I began to share my feelings about my family and personal life. When I finally finished, the weight of my words hung in the air. When tears of sympathy appeared in Ginny's eyes, she gently put her head on my chest and comforted me. I felt relieved that there was someone around who truly understood my pain. In a soft, soothing voice, she told me about the reason for her journey across the country with her children. Once upon a time, Jenny lived a perfect life, a happy childhood, the coronation of the prom queen, marriage with her high school sweetheart. They achieved their dreams together, created a family and built a life. But somewhere along the way, their once smooth path ended. Their quarrels began because of his relationship with other women, which eventually turned into an affair and led to physical beatings. Fortunately, their young children were shielded from this chaos. The word divorce has become a frequent topic of conversation between Jenny and her husband. And then one night, a call from the police changed everything. A young woman died in a car accident and Jenny's husband was found dead at the scene. It turned out that they were making love at the time of the accident. From that moment on, Jenny's life turned into a nightmare while she dealt with the consequences. Her in-laws pointed the finger at Jenny, the dead girl's family blamed her, and even she blamed herself to some extent. While the inheritance was going through the probate procedure, the mother-in-law's legal policy gradually depleted her late husband's assets. In addition, the family of the deceased girl initiated a lawsuit, which forced Jenny to file a counterclaim. Somehow she managed to overcome all the obstacles and difficulties that stood in her way. After carefully considering the possible options, she made the difficult decision to start from scratch. After carefully exploring various neighborhoods across the country, fate brought her to my neighborhood. Having invested all her savings in buying a new home, she was left with only the hope of a job offer from the school district and a hard-to-keep account in a hedge fund that she had to use to cover her expenses until she started working. Unexpectedly, she also had to make expensive repairs at home, which further depleted her funds. Despite all the difficulties, she remained firm in her decision to move here and does not regret anything. We sat in silence, watching the smooth movement of the swing back and forth. It was then that I expressed a desire to analyze her hedge fund account, confident that I could help improve her stock portfolio. Without saying a word, she got up and disappeared into the house, only to return a few minutes later with a folder in her hands. I took the papers from her and promised to look through them in the evening. She insisted that I keep them and return them the next evening when we sit down to dinner. After kissing me one last night, she said goodbye to me. When I got home, I immediately started examining her hedge fund account and quickly discovered the unethical actions of the manager in order to enrich myself. It became clear that he was not only a dishonest person, but also insufficiently competent in choosing stocks to invest in. I was confident that I could improve her score by 30% during the first year, 
Encouraged, I began to sketch out the questions that needed to be discussed with Jenny the next day, still lost in thoughts of her kiss. The next evening, I had dinner at Jenny's again. I put Kay to bed, read her a bedtime story, and said goodnight. Because of the cool night, we did not leave the house, and I sat down at the table to analyze the data, create spreadsheets, and make forecasts for Jenny. When she came downstairs, I had everything ready. She brewed another pot of coffee and asked about my conclusions. I informed her that she was being deceived, but assured her that I could help. While I was going into details, she came into the room, and I decided to ask what was bothering her. She assured me that everything was fine and that she trusted me, so I didn't need to explain anything. Instead, she invited me to join her in the living room to relax. We spent the evening talking while the fire in the fireplace was slowly dying down. Despite the age difference, I felt more at ease with Jenny than I had ever felt with Denise. And we kissed goodnight. Before she left, she gave me her signature to manage her stock accounts and gave me a standing invitation to join her for dinner. When I woke up, the first thing I did was deal with Jenny's financial situation. I immediately contacted her former broker to inform him of her dismissal and that I was taking control of the accounts. At first, he resisted, but quickly changed his mind when I hinted at the possibility of contacting the Securities and Exchange Commission. In the end, he agreed to reimburse Jenny for all the commissions totaling $5,000. A minute later, I received confirmation of her account adjustment. In general, a successful outcome. Having decided to review her investment fund, I started by getting rid of inefficient stocks and replacing them with more stable and reliable blue-chip stocks. The remaining funds were invested in high-risk and high-yield stocks, which required frequent attention, but with proper management could bring significant profits. To top it all off, I refused brokerage commissions for transactions. When the trading day came to an end, I was pleased with the changes made. With a sense of accomplishment, I went to dinner in the next room with a satisfied heart. When I brought up the subject with Jenny, she quickly assured me that she trusted me completely and that I didn't need to provide a daily report. This allowed me to continue to manage her account and spend time with her every evening. Now, our weekends were filled with walking around the city with Jenny and her children rather than working on home improvement projects. Although, to be honest, I helped Jenny with her own home projects. Her house was in the same deplorable condition as mine when I first started working, so my experience came in handy when we solved problems together and found solutions. It was Jenny who set the pace for our relationship. What started with a simple goodnight kiss quickly turned into passionate kisses as soon as the children fell asleep. Jenny made sure that I didn't go too far because she was too shy to do anything more when the children were around. Despite the fact that I went home with unfulfilled desires, it was enough for me just to hold her to me. Over the weekend, I met Ginny's brother Ray and his family who came in her car. We spent the evening grilling steaks and getting to know each other better. I felt that Jenny would soon start asking him what he thought of me, so I decided to be extremely honest with him. Ray, I want to be honest with you. I'm head over heels in love with Jenny and plan to marry her when the time comes. She is truly the greatest blessing in my life, and I cherish every moment we spend together. I understand that we have just met, and you may not know me very well yet, but I hope in time to show you how much I adore her," I said sincerely. From the very first day you met, it was obvious that you always help Jenny and the children. She appreciates you deeply, and I believe that the two of you are destined to be together. But I want to make it clear to you that if you ever hurt her like that sneaky man did, we're going to have a serious conversation, Ray said. Having said everything we thought, we connected the beer bottles and took the steaks into the house. After the meal, Billy and Kay took their relatives upstairs, and Ginny and I chatted with Ray and his wife. As a result, the conversation led to Ray and Ginny sharing awkward moments from their childhood. It was after midnight when Ray turned to his wife and offered, let's put the kids to bed, and then we'll crash into Jenny's room. Hinting at this, we wished each other a good night. Without saying a word, Jenny and I laced our fingers together and headed for my bedroom. 
The passion that followed was wild and unforgettable. Lost in the moment, we continued to hug each other in a blissful aftertaste, savoring every second. We both realized that we were hungry from physical exertion, and giggling, got out of bed. I quickly put on my shorts and grabbed a t-shirt, but found that Jenny was wearing the same thing. I eagerly hugged her once more while she playfully put on a new robe, and we went downstairs. While we were rummaging in the refrigerator, I was pleased to notice that our conversation was flowing easily and naturally, moving from neighbors to friends and lovers. Every time I looked at her sitting at the kitchen table, I felt like I missed her even more. She was sitting with her bare feet on the edge of the seat, and she was wearing only my t-shirt. I carefully picked her up in my arms and carried her upstairs, laying her on the bed. Looking at her with awe, I realized that I would do anything for her. I swore to protect her with all my might and make sure that nothing ever happened between us. At that moment, I realized the difference between Denise and Jenny. The time of sadness and endless work has passed. It's finally time to plunge into life again. Clinging to Jenny, I hugged her tightly, and she sought comfort in my hand in the dark of the night. We both had a premonition that the morning would bring us joy. After wishing her good night and kissing her, we fell asleep. Months flew by until one sunny day the doorbell rang. To my surprise, Denise and her companion, Paul Starling, appeared in the doorway, followed by Susan and Brian. This was not a complete surprise, as I had heard rumors about their return to the city. Denise had a suggestion for me and a request for a conversation. After closing the door, I stood and waited, leaving them to worry about the lack of an invitation inside. There was silence in the air because I had nothing to say. Eventually, Denise pulled herself together and spoke. She admitted that she had mismanaged our situation and expressed a desire to make amends. To my surprise, she told me that Paul was the same guy from the fraternity who was framed by her women's organization and with whom I unknowingly competed. Despite the fact that we never talked, Denise continued to date him, but it became clear that Paul was not going to let her go. Despite her attempts to distance herself from him, he continued to relentlessly pursue her. Denise was torn between loyalty to me and feelings for Paul. Trying to sort out complex emotions and make a decision, she realized that the choice she made would have an indelible impact on our entire lives. She found out that Paul now works for another company. Before she knew it, she was back in his arms. He insisted on conducting a paternity test for the children, and it turned out that they were really his. I understood why the children wanted to be with their biological father. Despite my disappointment, I remained calm and silent while Denise explained her decision. Stuck in a career rut, she felt it necessary to prioritize the well-being of her family by divorcing me and ensuring a good future for her children. That's why she demanded half of the profits from the sale of the marital home, despite the fact that I made all the payments. But now, it all came down to the fact that the family was moving to Atlanta in connection with her upcoming promotion. The hype around the revival of the old neighborhood where my grandmother lived has even reached Chicago. Investors sought to purchase and restore historic mansions to their former greatness. Denise was well aware that after the divorce, I lost my job at a brokerage firm and would not be able to afford the necessary care and maintenance of my grandmother's house. She offered to transfer ownership of the marital home to me and cover the rest of the mortgage. In addition, she presented a cash receipt for $100,000. The only condition was that I sign a document for my grandmother's house. I stood speechless while she waved the check in front of me. Eventually, her hand dropped, and I fell silent. I greeted them politely, noticing the smirks of triumph on their faces. Their surprised exclamations echoed through the foyer as they crossed the threshold of the house. In the soft glow of the majestic crystal chandelier, I willingly talked about the careful measures I had taken to restore the entrance to its former splendor. Having carefully restored every detail, I led the guests into the living room, where luxurious furniture perfectly complemented the magnificent decoration of the room. As we moved from room to room, 
I proudly talked about the painstaking work I had done on each room, and my guests admired the amazing transformation of my house. Susan's eyes widened in surprise as we entered the conservatory, where the majestic Steinway Grand Piano took center stage. Her love for music was evident as she gazed in awe at this beautiful instrument. The most extravagant gift I could give her as a child was an electric keyboard. With a feeling of longing, she ran her fingers over the keys as we moved into the next room. Climbing the stairs to the spacious and cozy bedrooms, we eventually found ourselves in the luxurious master bedroom, illuminated by the soft light of natural light coming through the windows. The bathroom of the owners was amazing. A shower cabin with several shower heads and a majestic clawfoot bathtub decorated with gold leaf. Going out onto the balcony, we opened a view of a huge Olympic-sized swimming pool with a pool house and a jacuzzi on the terrace. I led them through all the rooms until we were in my office. I told the story of creating mahogany panels and how I was looking for furniture that would fit perfectly into the interior. I proudly displayed valuable first edition books neatly arranged in bookcases, and my faithful golden retriever, Butters, wagged his tail next to me on the couch. Denise, who had a clear aversion to dogs, watched this with a disdainful expression on her face. I waved away her disapproval, no longer interested in her opinion. Now that the tour is over, they have a complete picture of my house. Do you really think that I will decide to return to this terrible place, which has brought me nothing but suffering? I asked. But then I was interrupted by two energetic whirlwinds jumping onto my lap. Dad, we're back from the aquarium! Billy exclaimed, and Kay quickly added, It's pronounced a aquarium! Despite the correction, Billy continued, enthusiastically talking about his visit to the aquarium in Atlanta. As they enthusiastically described their day, Billy confidently said, But Dad, our aquarium is much better. Kay agreed that the wall aquarium in the basement that I built for them was much better. Denise was stunned by the interrupted conversation, but I didn't explain anything when Jenny floated into the room seven months pregnant. Oh my God, I didn't know you had company, she exclaimed. Hurrying over to her, I sat her down in a chair and asked how she was feeling. She rewarded me with a grateful smile and a kiss. I quickly announced to the uninvited guests that they were not welcome and escorted them outside, making it clear that they were not to return. When they left, I realized that they had countless questions that they would never get answers to. For example, why, after returning from Chicago, I quickly left my house and moved in with my grandmother. When I entered her house, I noticed that the building was still in good condition and decided to repair it on my own. It became a form of therapy for me. Another part of the therapy was my job, after I worked in brokerage offices for several years. I discovered many ways in which a broker could circumvent the company's security measures and put it at risk. Despite the fact that I had to get permission from my boss for all operations, I, in fact, had freedom of action and could trade as I liked, thanks to my reputation as a careful and successful trader. But upon my return from Chicago, I took advantage of this trust by opening a fake business account and using the company's funds to trade furiously. By the end of the day, I had several thousand dollars in profit in my account. After that, I deposited every dollar in the company's cash register. Then I deleted all the transactions from the company's computers so that there would be no records left, and left. I know what I did was illegal, but I justified it by knowing how much I had earned for everyone I had worked for all these years. I was content with one day of reckoning. The next day, I started trading actively again, and by the end of trading, I had increased the company's treasury by $10,000. This trend continued throughout the week, when I doubled or tripled the company's money. With almost $200,000 in my account, I decided to take a short position on several overvalued technology stocks. It was the perfect moment because in the end, I got 600% profit on each of them without worrying about the margin requirement. Suddenly, my net worth exceeded $1 million, but soon my boss found out about my success. 
This was the same person who had criticized my work before, and now he demanded that I provide him with an invoice. In response, I quickly transferred the money to an offshore account with a few keystrokes. Turning to him, I bluntly told him to go to hell and quickly quit my job. After all these years, I continued to work until I had accumulated a considerable fortune. Therefore, I signed an agreement with Denise on the settlement of property relations without any problems. In her haste to save her property, she did not think about whether I had something of my own. My fate continued to take shape until I met Jenny and realized that I had the opportunity to start over from scratch. It was only when I tied the knot with Jenny that I revealed to her the amount in my account. When she heard the figure of $2 million, she was almost speechless. She was on the verge of fainting when I informed her that my fortune was just over $400 million. Then I informed her that I owned all the houses in the next block except hers. Surprisingly, not buying her house turned out to be a wise decision. She didn't understand how wealth and power were connected. Managing such a condition required careful legal supervision, and without her knowledge, I assigned this responsibility to Denise's firm. I made it clear to several senior partners that I was categorically against Denise becoming a partner, especially considering that she no longer had a valid license to conduct legal activities. This was due to the situation when Denise and Paul tried to deceive me by forging my signature on the documents for the registration of a second mortgage at the bank that held the mortgage on our marital home. Their plan was to get the funds from the cashier's check and burden me with a second mortgage. But their plan failed because I was also the owner of the bank and ordered that I be personally informed of any suspicious activity on this account. I got a call from my close friend, the district attorney, whom I supported in the previous election. He informed me that Denise and Paul would be charged with forgery. In addition, he assured me that he would take the necessary steps to ensure that both of them were excluded from the legal profession. Concluding the conversation, I couldn't help but wonder if Denise would choose to represent herself or use the services of a public defender during the trial. Given the recent news about the 8th Section Housing Project for the Poor, located next to my friend's homeowners association, I wondered what kind of support she would have left. A contracting firm owned by my conglomerate will be building a facility that could potentially reduce the value of homeowners' real estate in the area. I purchased this lot as a tax break on a portion of my annual profits, so it all seemed to be related. Sitting next to my beloved wife, I gently massaged her legs while our adopted children watched TV with their cousins, who now lived in Jenny's old house, which she gave to her brother. When I saw the happiness and satisfaction on her face, I smiled myself. Her smile lit up the room, and I knew it was going to be a special evening. Every moment of communication with Jenny was unforgettable, especially when I smiled back at her and gently massaged her tired legs. Greedy and deceitful Denise, along with her children, was left without means of subsistence when Paul traded Denise for a young model. And since they did not have time to tie the knot, Dennis and her children remained in poverty. They chased a beautiful life, but fate decreed otherwise and now they are stuck in loans. Occasionally they take turns calling me and telling me how much they miss me and asking me to borrow money. But I become smarter and I don't believe a single word they say. Hollis Thomas was relaxing by the gorgeous backyard pool, watching his wife Tiffany and their closest friend frolic in the gentle waves of the Gulf of Mexico. As he watched them, enjoying the sun and the sea, memories of their journey together and the victories they had achieved came flooding back to him. They realized their childhood dreams, leaving behind the harsh winters of their hometown and exchanging them for the warmth and beauty of the Gulf Coast. A sense of accomplishment filled Hollis with deep satisfaction as he reflected on their shared success. Living on the northern continent, they once dreamed of living in sunny Florida. But on this day, thoughts of escaping from his hometown were far from his mind. Instead, as he watched the couple frolicking in the sun, he couldn't get rid of the nagging memories of the rumors that had been haunting him since high school. 
The idol around him faded as he focused on the reality unfolding in front of him on the beach. Just a week ago, he believed that he loved Tim and Tiff more than anyone in the world. Over the years, he trusted them, relying on them for his very existence, joy, and even mental well-being. They were inseparable, almost as one. Their emotions were intertwined. If one of them felt sad or dissatisfied, everyone did it. If one person suffered, everyone felt the pain. But now he realized that the trust and affection he once felt for them were wrong. Hollis, Tiff, and Tim became friends on the first day of school, being in the same class. They immediately formed a strong bond that lasted until graduation from high school and college for him and Tiff. Timothy, on the other hand, was known for his calm personality and lack of motivation. Before owning property on the beach, he embodied the classic image of a beach bum. Devoid of ambition, he dressed in typical surfer clothes and talked in a casual manner, mixing the language of beach bums with alcoholic slang. Although Hollis had never seen Tim use illegal drugs, he was well acquainted with the world of alcohol. Despite his carefree lifestyle, women were attracted to him like bees to honey, captivated by his charm and attractive appearance. Tim was a talkative young man who knew how to keep his mouth shut when it came to women. He had a reputation for being able to charm almost any woman he laid eyes on, and it seemed that he was always on the lookout. Hollis has always believed that Tim is in control of his desires, especially when it comes to his best friend's wife, but recent events have proven otherwise. The trio has been inseparable since high school, applying to colleges only in Florida. The location of the college was more important to them than the prestige or degree they could get. When they were accepted to the same college, they decided to move in together to begin their path to higher education. But Tim quickly realized that college was not for him and eventually dropped out after studying for only one semester. Instead of continuing his studies, he decided to live near the beaches of Fort Myers, barely making ends meet while his friends were getting their degrees. Throughout his college years, Tim visited friends almost every weekend and summer, keeping in close touch with them, despite the fact that he had a different path. While Hollis and Tiff focused on their studies, Tim worked part-time at the beach and in the surrounding area, including working for a pool company to support himself. Despite the fact that Tim chose a different path, he kept in touch with his friends and continued to support them in his own way. Hollis has found his niche in the local beach business, particularly in the rental of beach equipment. He had a natural talent for persuading tourists to rent or buy equipment, attributing his success to a relaxed surfer image and charismatic speech. Working for his employer, who owned a beach equipment rental company, a small retail store, and a larger tool and equipment rental facility, Hollis did an excellent job. He mostly worked at an equipment rental shop, where Tim also worked, specializing in selling used equipment for rental on the beach. Tiffany and Hollis sold not only everything that could be useful on the beach, from sun loungers to swimsuits, sun creams, drinks, and more. In college, they both majored in business. Tiffany majored in marketing, and Hollis majored in a double major, management information systems and business management. After graduating from college, they quickly found jobs. Hollis started working in the equipment rental business with Tim's employer, where he quickly moved up the career ladder and became a store manager and second assistant to the owner. Tiffany got a job at a coastal boutique selling clothes and quickly rose to the position of assistant manager. All three friends worked side by side with each other and communicated daily. Hollis and Tim, who worked for the same company, often crossed paths and talked during the day. Tim often made it clear to Hollis that he was having lunch with Tiffany, since their jobs were on the same block and they often spent breaks together. Despite the fact that rumors began to circulate about Tim and Tiffany again, their friendship remained platonic. Hollis ignored their comments. After all, they were all childhood friends, and he had always trusted them. Tiffany had already met Tim in the past and quickly realized that he was not suitable for a husband. She rejected him and chose to marry Hollis, so he had no reason to worry. 
Besides women and beach holidays, Tim's real passion was Mustang cars. As soon as it came to cars, he readily joined in the conversation, enthusiastically discussing the Ford Mustang. All his cars, from the first to the current one, were Mustangs. Having saved up enough money, he was able to buy the car of his dreams, not just a Mustang, but a Shelby in ruby red metallic color with black accents. When he wasn't looking for adventures or relaxing on the beach, he devoted his free time to taking care of his beloved Mustang and refining it. Tiffany was the first to ride with him in a new car, and subsequently she became his frequent passenger. Hollis cherished memories of road trips, hiking and hanging out with his two closest friends, recalling the good times they spent together. Tiffany was always present in their lives, but it was obvious that she belonged to him. She made it clear that she was only Tim's friend, nothing more. But looking back, it seems that even then there was something more to their relationship. She never said outright that they were friends with benefits, but it was becoming more and more obvious. Hollis was stunned when confronted with her disrespect and infidelity last week. Only then did he realize that the rumors that had been circulating for many years turned out to be true. Delivering another set of rented scaffolding to the construction site, he couldn't help but regret that he hadn't volunteered for this job the day he found out about her betrayal. Hollis received an urgent call from the tenant and demanded that the scaffolding be delivered immediately. Reluctantly, he agreed, realizing that if not for this sudden duty, he might have remained blissfully unaware for some time. Ignorance turned out to be a real blessing when he realized that the rumors really turned out to be true. Anger bubbled in his stomach as memories of what he had witnessed on the beach surfaced in his head. How could he be so careless? Now the whole truth was clear to him. It was on this beautiful slow Tuesday that his life changed for the worse. When the order arrived at the store, he informed Mr. Wilson that he would personally deliver the scaffolding, instead of forcing their driver to stay late at work. This decision not only saved them from having to pay the driver overtime, but also allowed him to leave the store for an hour or so, leaving behind a satisfied customer. It seemed like a win-win situation at the time, but in the end, he ended up losing. He decided to return to the store along Beach Road, which passed by Tiffany and Tim's workplaces. Driving past a small, almost shack-like building, he couldn't shake the feeling of defeat. Tim had barely reached the door when Tiffany was already waiting for him, greeting him with a passionate kiss. His hands quickly penetrated under her blouse and began to caress, after which he hurriedly dragged her inside. When they entered the building, he couldn't resist running his hand down her skirt, making her smile and giggle. She playfully grabbed his arm and led him back as they made their way inside. As soon as the door closed behind them, she wasted no time pulling Tim to her and kissing him hard again. It was obvious that she was in charge this time. Tim quickly hung a closed for lunch sign on the door and then joined Tiffany, who led him further into the building, and her laughter echoed down the corridor. Meanwhile, Hollis parked his new Ford next to Tim's Mustang and hurried to the store, peering through the darkened windows. Finding no signs of movement inside, he realized that whoever was in the building had to either retreat into the storage room or exit through the warehouse door. Hollis quietly made his way to the back of the building and put the trash can under the dirty high window. With some effort, he managed to get up and look into the room from the inside. Although he could hear voices, the words were muffled and unclear. Quickly descending, he collected several pallets and stacked them under the trash can. When he got up again, he was able to look into the room, and what he saw destroyed his world. Tiffany was sprawled out on several discarded boxes, her blouse and bra were unbuttoned, and Tim was enjoying the view. Tiff's skirt was pulled up to her waist and Tim began his movements. Her heels lifted and pressed against Tim's hips, pulling him towards her as he leaned forward. Her moans and wheezes filled the air as Tim moved tirelessly. Hollis angrily took out his phone and took several pictures before leaving the scene. He was seething with rage. Memories were spinning wildly in his head, which he could hardly remember afterwards. 
He felt crushed, lost, as if he were floating aimlessly in a sea of confusion. In just a few agonizing moments, his once perfect life was destroyed. When he tried to get back to his daily routine at work, his boss sensed that something was wrong. Despite his concern, Hollis held back his emotions and simply said, I realize that reality does not always match our expectations or beliefs. Today I found out that I was wrong about what I was so sure of. Now I have to reconsider all my views on life. Hollis took his mind off the past week and focused on the sight before him. His unfaithful wife and former best friend frolicking and caressing each other in the surf. Tears threatened to fall as he listened to Tiffany's joyful laughter and Tim's loud giggles. He watched them, ideas swarming in his head, which he quickly discarded before coming up with a new plan. While he was thinking, his gaze wandered over the familiar surroundings of the house and yard. He realized that he would leave this place soon. He realized that he would miss Timothy more than he expected, and perhaps almost as much as he missed Tiffany. Fortunately, the only thing they will lose is the deposit for the apartment. Hollis was grateful that they didn't have time to save enough money for the down payment and chose a lease agreement with a subsequent purchase. Reflecting on his thoughts, Hollis saw Tiffany, who was returning to the yard with a radiant smile, holding Timothy's hand and playfully dragging him along with her. Her laughter and flirtatiousness were among the qualities that initially attracted Hollis to her many years ago. He appreciated her cheerful disposition, unfailingly good mood and affectionate nature. He had always liked her easygoing nature, but now he realized that it was a facade. Despite the fact that she was engaged and married, she continued to show these traits to others, making him doubt her devotion. He had convinced himself that it was just her character, but now he saw that it really was deceptive and flirtatious behavior. When Tiffany approached Hollis and let go of Tim's hand, he realized that he could no longer ignore the truth. The sun was shining brightly and we all gathered together on this beautiful day. Why do you have such a sad face? What's the matter? What is it? She asked, bending down to kiss me on the lips which I tried to dodge. Oh, nothing you don't already know about, Tiff. I was just thinking about a problem I encountered at work last week. I'll deal with her soon and get back to normal, Hollis assured her. So what made you feel so good today? He asked. Tiffany's smile faltered slightly, and she looked at Tim before answering. Hollis couldn't shake the feeling that there was something more than friendship in her gaze. He recognized the familiar expression on her face when she spoke, but this time he saw something more than just the surface. We're all here. Tim and I had a great time swimming and we're looking forward to having a quiet lunch together. What's on the menu today? She asked. Oh, have I been appointed the group's chef again? Hollis chuckled. It feels like I always cook alone, even when we're at Tim's. It's not fair, is it? But it's okay, she said. I'm sorry. I didn't think about it. I was too busy with my problems. But maybe we can come up with something together or just have a sandwich, Hollis suggested. But Hollis, you always cook such delicious dishes for us when we get together. It's part of what makes our weekend so special. Watching you cook and then enjoying a meal at sunset. I can't believe you missed this opportunity. What should we do now? Tiffany asked sadly. She looked at Tim, her eyes shining with desire, and then turned to Hollis, waiting for a decision. After cooling a bottle of wine and setting the table, Tim invited Tiffany to take a ride on his Shelby. They decided to buy a takeaway and enjoy their meal on the terrace. Tiffany mentioned a new restaurant in the city center that she would like to try, and it seemed to her the perfect opportunity. Worried, Tiffany hurried into their bedroom to change into a sundress and sandals. Back on the terrace, she smiled at Tim and said, Let's hit the road, Tim. Taking his hand, she led him to the parked cars. Her eyes were shining as she looked back at Hollis and said softly, We'll be gone for about an hour and a half, dear. The restaurant needs time to prepare the food for our arrival. I'll call you when we get back. Hollis froze in place, watching the front door close behind her. There was a roar of the Shelby and a screech of tires as Tim took off. He couldn't believe what had just happened. 
Similar situations had happened before, but this was something different, as if he finally saw everything in a new light. Tim and Tiff would often act out scenes for each other, and one of them would come up with a reason why they were running an errand together. Hollis hadn't thought about it until now. They've been doing this kind of thing since high school. Sometimes he and Tiff even left Tim behind. But unlike today, they had never made love, as he suspected. Now that they were married, they didn't have to make love in secret when they were on edge. After excusing themselves, they would go into the bedroom or wait until Tim left to go to bed. Hollis sighed heavily and returned to the patio, sitting down in an armchair with a glass and a bottle of Balvini. He did not cool the wine or arrange the silver plates. He stayed in the same place, not moving, even an hour and a half later, when Tiffany called and said they were already on their way home, giggling in the background. When the lovers finally returned almost two hours later, she felt no pain. In addition, he did not get up from his chair, continuing to sit in the courtyard. Tiffany and Tim returned home, and Tiffany's laughter filled the air as they entered through the front door. Their footsteps echoed through the house as they walked to the kitchen, chatting animatedly. Left alone, Hollis looked up as Tiffany stepped out onto the patio. Her chatter stopped abruptly when she saw the untouched table. Turning to Hollis, Tiffany accusingly asked why nothing had been done in their absence. She expressed her disappointment at Hollis's inaction and wondered aloud what had happened to them that day. Set the table quickly so that we can finally eat. We're starving, Tiffany pleaded. Looking at her disheveled appearance, he felt sad. Her disheveled hair, swollen red lips and breasts visible through a thin top clearly indicated that something had changed since their departure. Despite the silent observation, Tiffany ignored his expression of concern. Continuing to scold him for not cooking for their arrival, she gave Hollis no peace. While Tiff questioned him about his shortcomings, Tim calmly put the food on the table. Avoiding looking into her eyes, he seemed unable to accept the criticism. I glanced at both of them, then silently got up and headed for the kitchen. Returning with a plate and silverware, she quickly set the table for herself and began to eat. Tiffany ran into the house to get plates and dishes for herself and Tim, but by then he was already enjoying the meal. When she returned, she scolded Hollis again for not setting the table for everyone. He met her gaze and answered, I'm tired and hungry. It won't be difficult for you to bring your food here, so I'll let you handle it on your own. Then he focused on the food again. Tim joined everyone at the table, took a few bites, and then exclaimed, Dude, this is not fair. Why are you so hard on us? You didn't even cook. And then you act like you're powerful and arrogant when we go to a restaurant to have a delicious meal and you refuse to even serve. Come on, man, that's not like you. We're brothers. You have to cover for me. To help, you know? Your girlfriend is a great person and not helping her is disrespectful, you know? Hollis stared at Tim, his frustration growing. He glanced briefly at Tiffany, who looked guilty, and then turned back to Tim. Tiffany avoided eye contact, focusing on her plate and trying to distract herself from the tense conversation at the table. Tim, I don't like you questioning my decisions about how I run the household. I understand that I may have taken on more responsibilities in the past, but that will change. I deserve a weekend break just like you and Tiff. It's time for you to take on some of the work. Tiffany was stunned by Hollis's words. She looked at him incredulously when he asked, Is that a problem, dear? She struggled to find the words to express her feelings. It is quite obvious that Tim finds it difficult to cover his expenses when we go out together. He manages to scrape together enough money to pay for a car and rent a house. We have always supported each other, so why are you insisting on changes now? We are all adults here. We all have jobs, and we are responsible for ourselves. Don't you agree? Hollis asked. Yes, I agree. Therefore, if we are together, we must help each other. And when we are apart, we must be responsible for ourselves. It's common courtesy for guests to offer help when they stay at someone's house, she replied. 
I noticed that when we get together, you and Tim always have fun, and I do the cooking, serving, and cleaning. It feels like I'm the only one who has to cook and spend our money on it. This dynamic doesn't seem fair or equal to me, and I'm starting to get tired of it, Hollis said. Unfortunately, this led to the evening being filled with arguments, accusations, and resentments. Hollis chose not to reveal the reasons for his decision to take a firm stand in friendship and relationships with the other two, but it was obvious that he harbored some kind of hurt feeling. Over the next two weeks, he spent as much time as possible watching Tiffany and Timothy. Every week, he watched them repeatedly engage in intimate relationships, kissing and caressing. To his disbelief, he even managed to photograph them making love during working hours, two cases in one week and three in the other. It turned out that Tiff and Tim spent more time indulging in physical relationships with each other than Hollis and Tiff before he discovered them. While Tiff was in oblivion, Tim was definitely getting more than he was supposed to. In the second week, Hollis approached the owner and offered to close the store and the rental point on the beach, as well as fire Tim, which could significantly increase profits. Mr. Tompkins looked sharply at Hollis and frowned, wondering why he recommended closing Tim's store and firing him, especially since Tim was considered a friend of Hollis. Mr. Tompkins also noted that an additional employee is sometimes required at the rental center. Wouldn't it be wiser to move the store to another location rather than closing it and not letting a friend go? Tompkins asked. Although I understand that this may be an acceptable option in some situations, I believe that in this particular case it is not the most effective choice, sir. Hollis leaned closer to Mr. Tompkins and handed him a copy of his analysis before proceeding to present his arguments. I have many reasons to support my proposal, sir. The store itself is a key factor to consider. During peak tourist seasons, it has high attendance and makes a significant contribution to the overall profitability of the business. During the off-season, the store does not receive enough income to cover its operating expenses. If we keep the store open only from mid-April to mid-September, we will be able to receive 89% of its annual profit. I recommend either renting out the building or selling it entirely. If none of these options are suitable, then we should consider opening a store only during the peak season from April to September. I have provided detailed figures for each of the possible options, Hollis said. If the building is sold or leased, we have the opportunity to reserve part of the territory for a mobile store, which will operate only during the peak five months of the year. This can significantly increase the profit of a business, especially if you take into account rental income. In addition, the sale of the building can improve the bottom line, either by allowing us to invest in other rental equipment or by increasing interest income. And finally, I believe that keeping Tim as an employee will have a negative impact on the business because of his personal life and work habits. Hollis expressed his thoughts. Hollis bent down and handed Mr. Tompkins an envelope, then continued the conversation. I found out that Tim closed the business several times during business hours to make love to a woman in a warehouse. As a result, he was, in fact, robbing the company, continuing to receive a salary for these hours. I have evidence of seven cases in the last two weeks where the store was closed for almost an hour after lunch, in addition to the scheduled lunch break. Unauthorized closures have a negative impact on business due to possible loss of sales and rents. Besides, I can't keep working with him. I'm not giving you an ultimatum, but if he stays working, I'll look for another job, Hollis said. I can't believe they did that. Why? Tim and Tiffany were friends. In fact, you've all been more than friends for most of your lives, Tompkins wondered. I think it was, at least outwardly, Hollis replied. I recently realized that my beliefs were wrong. Tim is not a real friend, and Tiffany will soon stop being my wife. The contents of this envelope will explain why I came to such conclusions, sir, Hollis stated firmly. Mr. Tompkins frowned and reluctantly opened the envelope, giving Hollis a skeptical look. Looking at the first photo took his breath away, and he quickly scanned the rest before meeting Hollis's gaze. Son, I can't find the words. 
Now I understand your decision to distance yourself from Tim and the impending breakup with Tiffany. I can't help but wonder why you want to close the beach rental business. Is this a strategic move in business or a form of revenge? Hollis looked at his boss, took a deep breath, and confessed, I was afraid you'd take it that way. The incident between Tiff and Tim really influenced my decision, but I think it's the right choice for the business. I recommend our accounting firm to check my calculations to make sure they are accurate, but I am sure they are in the best interests of the business. The annual profitability of the store is minimal, and funds are spent on it that could be used more effectively elsewhere. According to my calculations, the store brings you an average of only $600 a month. Renting out the building or investing the sale price would bring in much more revenue, Hollis said. The accounting firm agreed with Hollis's assessment of the beach properties, with their analysis being even more critical than Hollis's. After considering all the factors, it becomes clear that it is necessary to explore alternative options to maximize profits. Hollis's failure to account for depreciation and insurance resulted in a net loss, as a result of which the store was closed and Tim was fired. On the same day he lost his job, Hollis decided to start divorce proceedings with Tiffany, giving appropriate instructions to his lawyer. In the morning he moved from their shared rented house to a neighboring apartment located near his place of work. Despite the turmoil in his personal life, Hollis returned to work at the store when Tiffany called him. After considering whether to bring up the subject, he decided it was better to have an uncomfortable conversation sooner rather than later. Gathering his courage, he greeted Tiffany with a hesitant, Hi Tiffany! Anticipating a heated discussion about their impending divorce, he was caught off guard when she asked instead, Did you know about this situation? Why didn't you tell us that Mr. Tompkins was planning to close the beach store and fire Tim? I thought we were all friends. How could you stand by and let this happen? Couldn't you convince him to at least transfer Tim to your store? He didn't pay for his apartment and car anyway, and now he's not able to pay for them at all. I invited him to stay with us until he gets back on his feet. Can you leave work early to help him with the move? What is it? She asked rudely. No, I can't. Mr. Tompkins and I repeatedly entered the store during normal hours but found it closed. Tim was nowhere to be seen. The store did not bring in money even to cover expenses and he decided to close it. I'm not going to help Tim with the move. It's time for me to leave, Hollis replied. Thirty minutes after their last conversation, Tiffany called again. This time Hollis reluctantly picked up the phone but was greeted by Tiffany's furious screams. She accused him of firing Tim and going to divorce her. Tiffany couldn't understand how Hollis could suddenly break up with longtime friends and end their relationship so abruptly. In response, Hollis asked how Tiffany could cheat on him with Tim and expect him to just put up with it. Tiffany denied the accusations, saying she had not cheated on Hollis. I have never done and will never do anything like this. Why did you decide that? Because you saw my photos with Tim? Or maybe because they witnessed your kisses and intimacy? But I want to assure you that I have never been unfaithful. I've never allowed anyone else to touch me like that. I would never betray you like that. Tiffany shouted into the phone. Hollis, I thought you understood. There were always only three of us. We've always been together. You know that. You've known since elementary school how much I love you. We all expressed our love for each other. Hollis, you know that Tim and I have a special bond, just like you and me. Please don't try to push me away because of Tim. I love you both. I always knew I'd marry you. Tim is a part of our lives, and we need him as much as he needs us. Let's get through this together, she begged. If you love Tim enough to have an intimate relationship with him, why did you decide to marry me? I interrupted her. Well, you're offering more stability. You have the opportunity to provide for our future children in a way that Tim cannot. Although he may be special to us, it is you who will be able to ensure the financial security of our family. The three of us will create a strong team that will be able to raise our children in love, guidance, and support. Tim will be able to share his thirst for life with them. 
I will provide them with the necessary upbringing and care, and you will instill in them the values of responsibility and a solid work ethic. Don't you see? Together we create the perfect combination where each of us plays an important role in the family dynamics. When Tim fails, you pick up the slack, ensuring prosperity and a comfortable life for all of us, just like now, she replied enthusiastically. Tiffany, I can't believe this. It seems that I didn't see the whole truth of what was happening. Goodbye, Tiffany. Hollis angrily slammed the phone shut, his face flushed and his hands shaking. The realization that she was cheating on him and helping Tim financially hit him like a brick. How could he be so blind? Without hesitation, Tiffany offered Tim to move in with her, but even then, he wouldn't be able to pay for the car. Two months have passed since the breakup, when Tim suddenly walked into the store late one evening. Hollis, still harboring anger and betrayal over Tim's affair with his wife, approached him at the door, intending to kick him out. But before he could speak, Tim pleaded, Dude, you have to help me. They're threatening to take my car away from me. Tiff paid for last month, but now we don't have any money at all. Could you lend me some money? Hollis was amazed at the boldness of Tim's request. What? You betrayed me and my trust by sleeping with my wife, and now you have the audacity to come here and ask for a loan for your car? Get out of here before I lose my temper and kick your ass, Hollis shouted. Hey kid, what is this negative energy? I know I slept with your wife, but you also slept with mine. It was kind of mutual, you know? We both thought you didn't mind, but now everything has changed. We've always had each other's back, man. I really need your help right now. We will be able to deal with all this regarding the separation of our women later. Hollis chuckled and replied, You know what, Tim? I think I can help you. Let me finish here, and then we'll go to the bank and settle everything. Tim's face lit up with relief and he smiled. He patted Hollis on the back and exclaimed, You're just a savior. I knew I could rely on you. Arriving at the bank that financed Tim's car, they asked for a meeting with a loan officer. When they sat down in their seats, the employee asked about the purpose of their visit. Hollis said, As far as I understand, you have a loan for Tim Redding's Mustang and he's overdue payments. I am ready to take over the payments to avoid confiscation. Can you agree with that? The loan officer hesitated. I can't give a definite answer right now. Tim intervened. But the payments are already coming in, aren't they? I never said I was giving up the car, man. I just needed a loan to cover the payments, Tim said worriedly. Hollis turned to the loan officer and asked for a minute to talk to Tim. He assured Tim that he was just applying for a loan and a car in his name so that he could take over the payments and keep the car in good condition. Tim relaxed and agreed, saying, Cool dude, let's do it. After gathering information about Hollis and conducting a credit check, the loan officer grinned and assured Tim, I don't foresee any problems with you taking over Mr. Reading's auto payments, Mr. Thomas. I can also handle the paperwork for the transfer of ownership to the state. Just a few forms and signatures and we'll sort it out. With these words, she cheerfully disappeared into the next room to pick up the necessary documents. As soon as she was out of sight, Tim straightened up and turned to Hollis, exclaiming, Dude! Why should I change my name to yours? Tim asked. I can't risk losing the car. Just relax, Tim, Hollis replied. I take care of all payments for you, so for legal reasons, the title should be issued in my name. You know how banks and the government work. It's either them or the road. Tim breathed a sigh of relief and confessed. I still don't understand anything about these legal stuff. I was just afraid that I would lose the car. About 45 minutes later, Tim handed the car over to Hollis who promptly paid the overdue amount. When they got into Hollis's car, Tim was back to his old self. Hollis tried his best to remain calm while Tim's antics tested his patience. Back at the store, Tim happily jumped out of the car and practically ran to the driver's seat. Grinning from ear to ear, he exclaimed, Hey kid, I bought a great thing yesterday. Let's have some fun and celebrate. Hollis replied, I can't right now, Tim. I need to finish the paperwork for your car. Tim shrugged and said, Oh, good. I thought we were done with this. Hurry up so I don't forget. 
See you later, dude. Tim waved to Hollis as he pulled out of the parking lot. Hollis followed suit, quickly stopping by the traffic police to transfer ownership of Tim's car. He couldn't contain his excitement and practically danced while he processed the documents and paid the fee with a smile on his face. Two weeks later, Hollis received the final divorce papers in the mail. Fortunately, the process turned out to be relatively painless, since he and Tiffany had the same income, which allowed them to avoid the hassle of paying alimony. The savings were negligible. They decided to leave their cars and personal belongings. No complications, no mess. He had deleted his name from the lease of the cozy house by the sea that they both adored, having finally freed himself from her. Despite his nostalgia for home and the closeness they once shared, he couldn't deny that he missed their regular lovemaking. Late Saturday night, or rather early Sunday morning, Hollis returned to their former home on a rented beach bike. With the greatest care and invisibility, he unlocked the door. Fortunately, Tiff did not change the locks and did not demand the key back, which allowed him to slip silently into the house. A smile appeared on his face when he saw the familiar keys to the Mustang lying on the table. Without hesitation, he grabbed them and prepared to leave. But then, a thought occurred to him. Where are the spare keys? Going to the closet where Tiff usually kept her purse, he rummaged through it and, to his delight, found a Mustang keychain on her keychain. Grabbing it, he left the house as unnoticed as he had entered. The moment of truth has arrived. He needed to move the motorcycle without attracting attention to himself. When he started the engine, it roared loudly, making him flinch. Despite the noise, he had to admit that the sound was quite impressive. Carefully pulling away from the entrance, Hollis headed home, planning to return later in his truck and pick up the motorcycle he had just ridden. On Sunday, after finishing lunch, Hollis received a frantic phone call from Tim, who was talking so fast that it was hard to keep up with him. Hollis, this is just terrible. Someone stole my car. You have to help me, man. What should I do now? Tim was almost crying into the phone. I can't do anything for you. Just take a deep breath and calm down, Hollis replied. After finishing the conversation, he leaned back in his chair and couldn't help but smile because Tim was still on edge. Meanwhile, Tim started working part-time at a pool sales company. Over the next week, Hollis tried to drive past the company where Tim worked so as not to miss anything suspicious. Finally, on Thursday, Hollis arrived just as Tim was getting into Tiffany's car to head home after work. Hollis couldn't help but smile as he drove past the couple and honked his horn. Even over the noise of the engine, he heard Tim's angry shout. Hollis stormed past before Tiffany could react. A few days later, on a sunny Saturday morning, Hollis was polishing his Shelby when a police car pulled into the parking lot behind him. The officer got out of the car and asked, Are you Mr. Hollis Thomas? Yes, it's me. Is there a problem, officer? Yes, a report has been received about the theft of this car. Could you show me the documents? He asked. Hollis handed over the documents. The patrolman studied them and replied, Everything seems to be fine. Hollis nodded understandingly as the officer handed him the documents. Thank you, sir. Have a nice day. Hollis smiled and replied, And to you, officer. I'm sorry, officer, but what problems did I have? Hollis asked. The officer nodded and returned to the patrol car to check the information. He returned a few minutes later and handed the documents to Hollis. We have received a statement from Mr. Tim that his car was stolen. The identification number of the car indicated by him matches this one. He claims that he saw you driving the car and asks us to return it. But the registration records confirm that you are the rightful owner of this car. Can you give any information about this subject, sir? The officer asked. Hollis grinned and leaned against the car in the shade. He explained, Mr. Reading owned this car but couldn't handle the payments. I agreed to take over the payments to maintain his good reputation. We visited the bank, where I took out his loan and ownership of the car. I do not know what his problem is, 
but I suspect that he may have been under the influence of alcohol either during our transaction or when he informed you, sir. We were friends once, but after the divorce, he sided with my ex-wife. I was worried that our relationship wasn't as close as it used to be. I allowed him to continue using the car for two weeks before taking it away from him. I thought two weeks would be enough for him to find alternative transportation, Hollis explained. I understand. Are you suggesting that he uses illegal substances and is trying to involve the authorities in your divorce process? The officer asked. No, I'm not hinting at that. I don't care how he feels about our divorce. I just mentioned that illegal substances may be the reason for his forgetfulness about selling the car, I replied. Okay, I'm sorry to bother you, sir, the officer apologized. Hollis was relaxing by the pool on a lazy Sunday afternoon when Tiffany and Tim suddenly appeared, causing a commotion. Before Hollis could react, they violently knocked over his chair and knocked him onto the hot concrete. Tim demanded angrily, Why did you steal my car? Return it to me immediately. Give me the keys. Hollis tried to reason with him, reminding him that he had helped him only out of pity for their past friendship and out of guilt for Tim's problems. He took possession of the car so that it would not be taken away again, and now he has new wheels, although not as impressive as before. It's amazing that my new car attracts girls so much. That's fair, isn't it? We both have great cars now, we just exchanged them. I bought a Mustang for my wife, and honestly, I think I got the best part of the deal. At least I won't have to worry about the Mustang leaving me for someone else without my consent, Hollis said with a grin. Tiffany let out a loud scream and began to cry softly. Tim looked at Hollis and muttered, It's just cruel, man. Hollis shrugged and replied, This is what it is. Leave now, otherwise I will be forced to turn to the authorities. I never want to see you both here again. Hollis said rudely, and continued to enjoy a lazy Sunday. Five months later, Hollis learned that Tiffany, along with Tim, had been detained and arrested for the use and possession of prohibited substances. What a sweet couple, Hollis thought to himself. It feels like I've devoted my whole life to bringing happiness to my wife and only then came to the painful realization that my efforts were fruitless. The realization that all my efforts and good intentions have been in vain causes deep pain. After 23 years of marriage, I'm starting to realize that I've never really known the woman who is the mother of my children. She always seemed to be striving for something more, never content with what I could give her. Despite all my efforts, she never had enough of it, while I prided myself on being a good breadwinner, she constantly demanded more, making me feel inferior and dissatisfied. After graduating from high school, I married Sharon. She had short, dark hair and a beautiful figure. Until recently, our intimate life was wonderful, and I never doubted her fidelity. I started my career with engine repairs, and now I work as a heavy equipment mechanic and earn, it seems to me, good money. Our early years were typical. We started living in a small house and moved twice while our family was growing up. Now that our two children had moved on to a new stage in their lives, daughter Sarah got married and son John joined the Air Force, the house seemed too big for the two of us. Despite the changes, my wife Sharon still looked unhappy. A few years ago, both my parents died in a tragic car accident, leaving us with a sense of loss. Feeling anxious after the departure of the children, Sharon decided that she needed something to occupy her time. Unfortunately, this decision led to unexpected problems. She got a job at a real estate management firm, which was mostly run by a man named Glenn Sebastian. Apart from a few employees, the firm was essentially one person, and Glenn was its boss. I met this man, but I didn't like him. Unfortunately, he ended up having an affair with my wife, even though he was married. Then... I felt defeated. What's the point of continuing a relationship? My children grew up, and my wife was unfaithful. As a last attempt, I talked to Sharon. Now that the kids have left home, I'm thinking of selling our house and moving to Florida. How do you feel about this? I can find a job there, and we can enjoy a better life under the sunny Florida sky. 
I'll pretend I didn't hear that, she muttered, without taking her eyes off the morning paper. Every day our conversations became more intense. It became clear that the problem was with me. Because of my lack of eloquence, I could not convince anyone of anything. Sharon has come to terms with it, getting used to my flaws. On the other hand, Glenn Sebastian was the epitome of charm and charisma. He easily conquered others with his words, so it's not surprising that he managed to seduce my wife. I guess what I'm saying, Sharon, is that I'd like to get you away from Glenn Sebastian so I can get my life back. But Charlie, Glenn is not going anywhere and there is no way back for us. We both need to keep working and accept that nothing will change. This is final. Despite the fact that I had evidence of cheating, I never told Sharon about it. She continued to live as if I hadn't noticed what was happening, using $2,000 from the fund of his fishing boat. I received the detective's report and photographs detailing what was happening. Sharon got carried away with the newspaper when I went to work. That day I decided to quit my job. In the early days of our marriage, Sharon and I loved spending time together, like fishing and going to concerts. We made efforts to make each other happy. With the advent of children, our lives became more difficult, but we always found time to relax. As the children grew up, it began to seem that I had to put in more effort at work. I think that's when our relationship started to deteriorate. I prioritized saving for retirement, while Sharon preferred to live luxuriously. She insisted on driving a BMW, which, in my opinion, was beyond our means. Instead of arguing with her, it was easier for me to let her get her way. Despite all my efforts, I couldn't keep her from cheating on Glenn Sebastian. Although I loved her, I couldn't stand her mistreating me and decided to give up. My trusted lawyer, Seymour Schlamp, withdrew another $2,000 from my yacht fund. I gave him the detective's report and the photographs. I also signed some blank forms, gave him a power of attorney for the property, and told him to file for divorce on Monday. Sharon and Glenn had a normal day at the motel today. They arrived at the same motel, stayed in the same room, arrived at the same time, and arrived on the same days of the week. I couldn't figure out what was so interesting about it for Sharon. They usually checked in at 11 a.m. and left at 2 p.m., which gave me a few hours to prepare. Sebastian's holding company owned many small buildings that they rented out, but the main income came from two old warehouses. Glenn bought them at a bargain price after the previous owners refused to renovate the buildings in accordance with the norms. The warehouses were empty, serving only as storages for local entrepreneurs. I doubted Glenn had bothered to install a fire alarm. I spent half an hour at each warehouse installing the necessary equipment, and then went to the bank. I emptied my savings, checking, and cash accounts, canceled my credit cards, and hid all my cash in a locker at the bus station. It's time to act. The plan was simple, to cause massive destruction and get caught. I was sure that nothing could break it. When I drove up to the disco motel, fire trucks raced past me, responding to two fires in a warehouse in the distance. Sharon's BMW and Glenn's Mercedes were standing next to each other, and I parked my car in the back lot and took out the tools for my new profession from the trunk. I had a glass hammer, an aluminum baseball bat, and pliers in my arsenal. Accuracy and timing were extremely important, because at any moment Glenn could get a call and report a fire in the warehouses. Feeling the pressure, I quickly set fire to a towel soaked in gasoline and stuffed it into the gas tank of my car. When the Ford was seconds away from exploding, I had to run as fast as I could. The explosion was not as dramatic as in the movies, but rather muffled. It may seem strange to purposefully ruin my own car, but I won't need it anymore. In less than a minute, I took the rods out of eight tires. Taking my time, I smashed all the windows with an emergency hammer. After a slight hitch when Glenn's car alarm went off, I quickly started smashing the BMW with a baseball bat. At the same time, each panel was destroyed to the ground. At that moment, the hotel staff and several guests gathered in the parking lot, all of them talking furiously on their cell phones. I was sitting on the roof of the Mercedes when Glenn came out of his room hurriedly pulling on his pants. He shouted something in my direction, 
but his words were lost in the chaos. I think he wanted me to stop banging on the roof of his car, but I couldn't be sure. Ignoring his incomprehensible instructions, I returned to the BMW and continued to strike until the police finally showed up. My car was left on fire while firefighters fought a huge double warehouse fire. When the police escorted me to the patrol car, I caught a glimpse of Sharon looking out of the window of a motel room. Within an hour, I was processed, printed, and photographed, to the annoyance of the photographer, who could not get me to wipe the smug grin off my face. Finally, I could sit in the cell and relax, knowing that I had already pleaded guilty to everything that happened at the motel. There was no need for a protracted trial, as it is shown on TV. The topic of warehouses was raised a couple of times, but I denied my knowledge, and they quickly got down to business. It seemed that eventually they would have to connect all the dots, but at that moment there was not enough communication. As news of my actions and motives spread through the station, the atmosphere became more relaxed. The next morning, Sharon showed up with my bail. Since there was no money in the account, she could only ask Glenn for help or take out a second mortgage. I doubted very much that Glenn would agree to contribute 10% of the $400,000. Through the glass partitions behind the cash register, I could see that Sharon looked visibly angry. It was clear that she knew about the emptying of accounts. I took my watch, wallet, belts and money, and did not dare to leave through the lobby. Instead, I asked one of the guards about an alternative exit so as not to meet my angry wife. He chuckled slightly, led me to the fire exit and holding the door alarm switch with a baton, led me out into the alley. Finally free, I took some cash out of my locker and bought a bus ticket to Chicago. Without choosing a specific place, I boarded a high-speed bus going in this direction. Looking out the window at the farmlands passing by, I had enough time to reflect on my circumstances. Although I was in a much worse state than before, at least my unfaithful wife could no longer humiliate me. I was able to live comfortably thanks to the savings I had, which I knew would last me for several years. But I knew that eventually I would have to find a job to keep my sanity. I didn't know what to do with income tax and social security, as well as the process of obtaining a driver's license. After my stay in Chicago, I decided to take shorter routes through various small Midwestern cities. I was driving through the heart of South Dakota right now. When I came across a forgotten newspaper, I began to carefully look through every line out of boredom. One ad caught my attention, and I began to reread the same job ad many times. The announcement stated that in Mitchell, South Dakota, an experienced mechanic of heavy agricultural equipment is required with the provision of housing, food and wages, depending on experience. Leroy Summers' contact information was provided. Despite the end of summer, the unusual coolness of Mitchell, South Dakota surprised me. The sky was gray and gloomy, as was the ground beneath it. It seemed like the perfect place to mope and reflect on sorrows. The equipment repair shop in Fairfax was located in a huge steel warehouse that looked remarkably like an airplane hangar. Its sliding doors were spacious enough to accommodate even the largest agricultural machinery. The origin of the name remains a mystery to me, Perhaps it belonged to one of the former owners. It was quite easy to get a job at the store, and the living quarters were located on the upper level of the maintenance building. The atmosphere was gloomy. There was no comfort or warmth in it. The remuneration for the work was very modest, especially considering that the room has a kitchenette. But the most positive thing about the whole situation was my new roommate. A native of El Paso, Jorge Toledo was a legal resident. He was a little older than me, but our physique and appearance were similar. He had long hair pulled back in a ponytail and a large mustache resembling that of Pancho Villa. Unlike him, I was clean-shaven, had my hair cut short and wore glasses. As soon as I met Jorge, I realized that I liked him. He worked in the field of hydraulics and mechanics and really wanted to hire a machinist like me. We were a great team. In addition, he owned a Mazda truck that had not been produced for several decades. Despite the fact that they stopped being produced in the 70s, his truck had already traveled more than 300,000 kilometers and was still on the move. 
Having settled into my new role, I spent time with Jorge with interest. It was difficult for both of us to figure out how to cook, so we often preferred to have dinner outside the house. Fast food and junk food made up the bulk of the food in the eateries. Jorge struggled with alcoholism, and Leroy was a condescending boss who let us work at our own pace. Leroy was responsible for money management and customer interaction, and Jorge and I were responsible for equipment repairs. We enjoyed visiting interstate truck stops, where we had breakfast late at night. Everything was going well, but four months later, when I returned from the delivery, I found Leroy and Jorge waiting for me in the parking lot. They laughed when I drove up in the delivery car. I couldn't figure out what was funny about this situation. I tried to keep a serious expression on my face. Today, we have an unexpected guest, a private detective from Philadelphia who was looking for Charlie Terrell. Leroy seemed to be enjoying the moment. Despite the fact that we had a close friendship with Horg, our communication with Leroy was strictly professional. We were all close to each other, but Leroy tried to keep his distance from the staff. Keeping his distance made it easier for him to swing the whip. Damn, I had a feeling this was going to happen. Who called my wife or the bail company? He didn't tell me or explain how he found me here. It looks like I need to continue on my way. Where did he go? Jorge's laughter, backed up by Leroy's giggles, indicated that he was drunk again. What was funny about this situation? George felt out of place. Leroy said confidently, I'm Charlie Terrell, forcing the man to study the photo carefully and shake his head in disbelief. A conversation ensued between us, during which I told about my undocumented status and admitted that I had purchased a social security number and a driver's license from a friend in Denver. He became increasingly angry, but did not require any documents. In the end, after about 20 minutes, he left in his car. Leroy remarked, You and I are a good duo. I like spending time together. When Leroy returned to his office, he couldn't help but chuckle. The weather was getting colder and colder, and the work moved into the category of maintenance, not repair. There was no sense of urgency anymore, which made it possible to work at a calm pace. The nights were getting longer and colder, and the days were getting drearier and more boring, which, oddly enough, calmed Leroy. Meanwhile, George seemed to be turning to alcohol more and more often. One weekend, George and I went to a bar in the Four Corners truck stop, where I found a mobile phone left on the seat. Normally, I would just tell the waitress about it and move on. I changed my mind today. Not wanting to make an order for myself, I asked Jorge about it and left. Then I decided to call Sarah first. Dad, why are you in Tulsa? She asked. I thought I should call you and let you know that everything is fine. We have already started to worry, and Mom is very worried. What made you leave so suddenly? Did people think you were crazy? What did Mom tell you? She just said that you weren't satisfied with her job and that she refused to quit. You panicked and crashed her car and her boss's car. Is that all she told you? Yes, she mentioned that after she bailed you out, you disappeared without a trace. She even hired a detective, but he couldn't find you. I think it hit her wallet hard. The next time you see her, try to get a full explanation. She definitely didn't share the whole story. You owe her. Why are you in Tulsa? Her caller ID says you're in Tulsa. I may not be in Tulsa, but the person who lent me his phone seems to be from there. Next time you talk to John, please tell him that everything is fine. Besides being irritable and touchy, she lost her house when you didn't help her, and now lives in a mobile home on the highway. The insurance company did not cover the damage to her car, so she had to buy it at auction with her own funds. The BMW finance company is still demanding payments for the car. Now she works in a waffle maker near the airport. She works extra shifts to make ends meet, and every time I talk to her, mom is furious at you. She's not happy. Dad, you're not well. Could you tell me what's going on? No, don't tell mom that I contacted you. If you want to know more, you'll have to get the details from her. I think I got it. Call me back when you get a chance. I love you. I love you too and would like to meet you. 
Before the connection, there were a few minutes left before the food delivery, so I decided to call Seymour. Hi Seymour, this is Charlie Terrell. What's new? I asked. Charlie, you're in trouble. The bail company, the cops, and your wife are looking for you. Seymour replied grimly. Well, at least they're looking for me somewhere, I joked. But what about my divorce? Everything is settled. Sharon reluctantly signed the papers so the divorce should be finalized in about three weeks, unless something unforeseen happens, Seymour told me. For your information, your house no longer belongs to you. I know about it. I'm wondering what's going on with Glenn Sebastian. Mr. Sebastian is no more. He ran away, disappeared. Your wife was upset about it too. She was counting on his help, but he left town. Apparently, he provided false reports to insurance and mortgage companies about the repair of sprinkler systems in his warehouses. The insurance company found out that it was arson. He turned out to be the main suspect, so the insurance company refused to pay. In addition, two people whose belongings were stored in his warehouses were unable to receive insurance refunds, and Glenn was forced to flee to protect himself. And one more remark. I have to inform the authorities about this conversation. You do understand, don't you? That's what I assumed. What will you tell them? That you contacted me from Tulsa to find out about the progress of your divorce. Is that a good answer? Don't worry, Seymour. Just keep this information away from Sharon whenever possible. After the divorce is signed, could you send the documents to my daughter? Don't worry. Take care of yourself, Charlie. I'm glad you came to me. When I returned to my seat, the waitress had already put the plates on the table. No sooner had we finished our meal than a monster trucker came to our table in search of his mobile phone. He looked very pleased that the phone was returned to him and even reluctantly agreed to 20 bucks when I mentioned that I had made two calls. Despite the fact that everyone wanted to contribute, I insisted that Jorge pay the cost of breakfast. Over the next week, he needed to take breaks and replenish his alcohol supply before heading home. Work was delayed due to the snowfall, but Leroy didn't seem to care. Horge and I took this opportunity to relax more, but Horge's addiction to alcohol only worsened. Meanwhile, I hadn't cut my hair since I left home, and now I could tie it in a ponytail. To amuse myself, I decided to grow a mustache. Every day, Jorge and I became more and more like each other. One day, when Jorge sobered up a little, I went up to him and asked him to explain why he drinks so much. I was once happily married to a beautiful woman named Marisol from the city of Waco. We had a good job and a cozy home, but everything changed one terrible day when Marisol caught me in bed with her sister. I despised her sister and couldn't understand why I had betrayed Marisol so basely. Marisol was furious and threatened to gut me if I didn't leave right away. Devastated by my actions, I became addicted to alcohol to numb the pain of my stupid mistake. I deeply regretted my actions and would like to go back and change what happened. At least I had a reason to betray. I was hoping that he would stop drinking, or at least reduce the dose, but it seems that he is determined to bring himself to unconsciousness. He reminded me of Nicolas Cage in a dark movie. Despite excessive alcohol consumption, he managed to keep working. When my driver's license expired I didn't know what to do next. I was thinking of just getting new ones, but I was afraid that Pennsylvania might be notified, and they would find me. Jorge also had to renew his license in the state of South Dakota. After long discussions under the influence of alcohol, we agreed that I would renew Jorge's rights with my photo and signature. Jorge decided to give up driving completely. We decided that by simply taking off my glasses and fixing my hair, I would be able to do this task. I didn't think about the consequences, about the risk of being caught. By the end of the week, I had successfully become Jorge Toledo on paper, having received a new driver's license. Jorge even suggested that I start using his social security number. He was not hiding from the authorities, but rather avoiding his angry wife, who most likely was not looking for him. George started drinking heavily, 
as a result of which his business at work began to decline. Leroy was aware of the situation, but decided to turn a blind eye to it. As a result, two months later when spring began, Jorge died peacefully in his sleep at the age of 45. Leroy reported this to the authorities and arranged for Jorge's cremation. What happened next shocked me. When the coroner came for Jorge, Leroy helped him fill out the necessary forms. I tried to keep my distance until they were done. When the coroner left, Leroy handed me a death certificate with the name Charles Raymond Terrell at the top. Three days later, we scattered his ashes with the breeze. Since Jorge was not wanted by either the immigration service or law enforcement agencies, a wide range of opportunities opened up for me. Leroy was busy looking for a replacement until the busy days began. As a precaution, I decided to apply for a credit card. I didn't see the need to buy my own mobile phone. Leroy bought several phones for work to replace the outdated CB walkie-talkies, which provided unlimited talk time and range. I traded the Mazda for a Ford Ranger. I needed to get in touch with Sarah before she heard the sad news. Dad, you're in South Dakota right now. Isn't caller ID a wonderful thing? Let's keep this information from Mom. Don't tell her anything. I managed to convince her to tell me the reason for your disappearance. I don't feel the slightest pity for her. By the way, the divorce papers were filed last month. You're officially single now. Unfortunately, I'm officially dead. What does this even mean? My colleague died at work, and by mistake the coroner entered my name on the death certificate. You'll probably get a notification soon, so try to feign surprise and disappointment, but don't dwell on it too much. You can tell John about it, but please don't tell your mother about it. It's pretty weird. I do not know how you did it, but I congratulate you. Let's keep this between us. I hope the police and your mom stop looking for me. My remains have been cremated and scattered, so no funeral or other procedures are required. I'm glad my grandparents aren't around at a time like this. I'm sorry I didn't insure you. Don't worry about it. We're doing well and John just got another promotion. He also has another tour planned. Do you have a new name or is it better that I don't know about it? Let's just say that your father is now a Mexican-American and leave it as it is. Dad, Eric and I wanted to ask if we could come visit you. I'm pregnant and I really want to spend time with you. I understand that returning home is not the best option for you, but could we come to you? We recently bought a new Subaru Outback, and Eric really wants to go on a trip. I'll think about it and let you know next week. I don't see anything difficult in this, but I don't have a place where you can stay. I live in a garage now. I'm sure there will be models in this area. Please don't forget to call me. I found a small motel nearby and reported it to Sarah. She and her companion will arrive in a week. Leroy is still looking for someone to replace Horge. Having breakfast in the morning was not as pleasant as it used to be with my dear friend. As I walked back to the garage, I couldn't help but think about how hard and lonely Jorge was when he passed away. The thought of him dying alone scared me. When I arrived, Leroy was already waiting for me with a smug grin, hinting at the surprise he had prepared. I didn't dare to find out what it might be. You have a visitor? He announced. I couldn't figure out who could have come to me. Surprise, this is your wife, he said. My heart stopped, but not from joy, but from fear of the inevitable meeting. Despite all the precautions I took to avoid her, she somehow managed to track me down. All the efforts and troubles I went through were in vain. It seemed impossible to me that she would find me, but she did. As I was heading to the workshop, Leroy's rather wide grin caught my attention. I was wondering what could be so funny. Crossing the floor, I climbed the stairs and, without hesitation, opened the door. Inside, I was surprised to find a stunning woman with long black hair and dark eyes that accentuated her Latin American features. Even though she was in her thirties, her body looked much younger. Her question caught me off guard. I soon realized why Leroy found him so funny. Marisol found Jorge, the man she kicked out two years ago but she couldn't forget. You're not Jorge, who are you? She asked, clearly confused. 
Why did this terrible man send me here and tell me that Jorge would be coming soon? I offered her a seat, and she reluctantly sat down, not taking her eyes off me. Can I get you something to drink? I suggested it. No, she replied abruptly. For the next hour, I tried to convey to Marisol the depth of Horge's love for her, and his remorse for what he had done. I also needed to explain why I used his name at all. There was still some alcohol left in Horge's stash, and we decided to finish it. It was unclear if we were honoring Jorge's memory or trying to drown out our grief. As a result, Marisol stayed the night at our house. The next day we went to the spacious playground, where Leroy and I scattered the ashes. After that, she left without receiving the expected reward. She forgave his betrayal, but she didn't have a chance to express it until I issued a credit card. I mourned her passing. In my idealized version of events, Marisol and I had an intense romantic night. But in reality, this did not happen. Sarah is due to arrive next week, and I have something to strive for.